regular meeting of the Enfield Town Council. Today is Monday, May 6, 2013. I would ask everyone in the audience to please stand for a prayer led by Councilman Bill Lee, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Lord, we pray for wisdom, patience, empathy, and the grace to discern your truth this evening. Please bless this council and the staff and the officials that support it. Bless our charter governing our community and the constitutions anchoring our state and sustaining our nation. Lastly, as we do every two weeks, we pray tonight for the men and women of the Connecticut National Guard and the U.S. Armed Forces who are serving overseas. Keep them safe in their missions and secure knowing that we here are keeping them in our thoughts and prayers. We ask all these in your name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Bill. Uh, may we have roll call, please? Councilman Lee. Here. Councilman Mancini. Here. Deputy Mayor Nelson. Here. Councilman Stokes. Here. Councilman Arnone. Here. Councilman Bosco. Here. Councilman Crawley. Councilman Edgar. Here. Councilman Hall. Here. Mayor Copen. Here. Councilman Kinsler. Here. We have 10 members present. One is absent. For our fire evacuation announcement, I remind everyone in the audience that in the event that the fire alarm sounds here at Town Hall, that everyone must evacuate the building. The closest exit would be to the rear of council chambers and out to the front of Town Hall. If you choose to take this side door to your right or left, we ask that you take the back set of stairs uh, to the back side of Town Hall and out to the parking lot. Minutes of the preceding meetings, uh, we have five different meetings uh, to address. The first would be the special meeting of April 11th, 2013. So moved. Second. By Deputy Mayor Nelson, seconded by Councilman Mangini. Any discussion? Sensing none, by show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, any abstentions? Unanimous. Special meeting of April 13th by Councilman Kensler, Second. seconded by Deputy Mayor Nelson. Discussion? Sensing none, show hands, all those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention, correct, Tom? Yes. One abstention. Special meeting, April 15th. So moved. Second. By Councilman Mangini, seconded by Councilman Kensler. Discussion? Sensing none, show hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, any abstentions? Unanimous. Regular meeting, April 15th. So moved. Second. Councilman Mangini, seconded by Deputy, I'm sorry, Councilman Kensler. <laughs> Promotion there. Discussion? Sensing none, show of hands. All those in favor? Those opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. And the special meeting of April 18th, 2013, so by Councilman Mangini, seconded by Councilman Kensler. Discussion? Show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, any abstentions? And that is unanimous as well. Uh, special guests, um, we have no scheduled uh, special guests for this evening. So we will move to item seven, public communications and petitions. If there's anyone in the audience wishing to address the council, I ask that, that you please raise your hand. I will call on you. Uh, come forward to uh, the front table. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, please keep your comments to no more than five minutes. I do have to time you. If you get to about 4.30, I will uh, politely interrupt you and ask you to please wrap up. And there is a reminder that if you need more than five minutes, um, you can come up a second time after all those that wish to speak have had a chance for the first time. And we ask that you play, please refrain uh, from the use of personalities. Uh, public communications. Is that Karen? Yes.
you just stand since Chris doesn't have a chair? Sure. You can sit. No, no, you can. Okay. I'm Karen Waslisa. I am, um, and this is Chris Gomo. I'm at 25 Renee Lane, and you? 19 Winter Way. And we are here representing, um, we are both residents, but we're here representing KITE, which is key initiatives to early education. And um, I'm certain just from that introduction, you understand that we're here um, supporting the school budget. Um, just to give you some brief statistics, we've spent the last 12 years exploring what our community offers to support the early care and education of young children. Um, and some quick statistics brought to you from the 2013 Connecticut Counts Data Book. Um, in Enfield, and I'm only looking at our Enfield statistics, and I did this at a glance, so I'm being upfront that I could have missed a line, but I think not. Um, we have 11.2% of children under 18 living at or below the federal poverty level. We have 364 children who are on care for kids. We have 223 children who have received temporary assistance for needy families, and we have 1,000 36 children who have received SNAP benefits, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, of the, and in regard to education, 65% of our children have come to school um, with, uh, um, with, a, with no preschool experience, no identifiable preschool experience. Some may have been in programs that we haven't recognized, um, but they self-identified as not having a preschool experience. And I could have that skewed, so I will check it and, and email all of you. It's either they came with or without. But in any event, we're looking at near 50% or just <laughs> over one way or the other. Um, so obviously, we know that the surest way to combat child poverty is education. And we are encouraging you to support um, the school budget, which will help us fund full-day kindergarten, which we, th which we think will address some of that, mitigate some of those factors. Um, is there anything you want to add, Chris? I just think it's important also to note that um, we just finished applying to the William Casper Graustein Memorial Fund again this year for implementation funding for next year. Um, like Karen said, they've been supporting us for 12 years. Um, part of that implementation dollars have gone towards local data collection here. So we'll, we will be able to look at um, the strategies that we've outlined in the early childhood plan um, based upon input from our entire community. So we'll be able to actually look at those strategies and have some data to mark the progress of what's working and what still needs to be worked on. And I just think that it's important to note, as Karen had said, we've come to you before in support of full day kindergarten and we understand that um, you do not make the education budget. But what we are asking is that you consider um, not only full day kindergarten, but supporting the entire education budget going forward. If we have full day kindergarten, but are cutting programs, um, other programs, it's going to offset whatever benefit the full day program would be. So we are asking that you consider the budget in its entirety. So thank you. We could speak to bigger issues, but Kite really is just focused on pre-K through third grade. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank Thanks, you very Scott, much. You. Appreciate it. Public communications. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jennifer Monkey, 17 Booth Road. Um, I wanted to take just a few minutes to offer another perspective and some of the ideas that were put forth at last week's joint uh, Town Council Board of Ed presentation on the town budget. A number of folks last week stated that we don't need things like education, we only need things like food and shelter. And I agree that, that if our goal is merely survival, but that's not my goal for my children. I want so much more for them than that. I want them to thrive. I want them to be upstanding members of their community. I want them to be creative thinkers and responsible and dedicated parents. And I want them to leave the world just a little bit better than when they found it. And I think that's probably what most parents want for their children. Um, I don't really want to be part of a society that, that thinks that the, the best we can do is manage to live through another day. That's, that's survival and that's kind of depressing. Um, but I think we have every right to demand more of that, of ourselves and of our community. I also recognize that in ex increases in expenses are tough for seniors and people living on a fixed income. They're tough on everybody. My household doesn't have buckets of extra money lying around, in large part because I chose to be a stay-at-home mom. Living on my husband's paycheck, there's no room for extras in our budget. So I understand when folks say they can't afford to pay more in taxes. But if we want to grow our tax base, we need to encourage folks and businesses to move here. And one way to do that is by offering a top-notch education. 
more people and more businesses in town mean more people paying taxes, which leads to more revenue, perhaps a little less out of everyone's pocket. I also think it's important to note that while 28% of our households in Enfield are made up of senior citizens, 29% of our households are made up of families with school-aged children. So the perception that seniors outnumber families is, is wrong. Further, I wanted to agree with Mrs. Mangini that our teachers earn their salary. I understand that teachers in Enfield make a nice living. I'm sure they all have bachelor's degrees and I bet all of, most of them have master's degrees as well. They worked hard for that expensive education and with higher education typically comes higher pay. That's how our society is structured. As for why they earn more than the state average, well shame on us. We negotiated that contract and now we've got to live with it. But I worked in HR for a long time before becoming a stay-at-home mom and while 40 to 90,000 a year is a good living, I wouldn't say these people are rich. Um, not, you know, when one bedroom apartment in town runs you $1,000 a month. I'm not saying that they deserve our sympathy, but I'm not saying they're tycoons either. Yes, they do have a couple months off in the summer, and again, if we don't like it, shame on us. We allow our educational system to continue in a 19th century agricultural schedule. It's unfair to penalize the teachers for that. And I do wonder if some of the noise about teachers being overpaid comes from the fact that average household incomes in Enfield is $67,402, according to the 2010 U.S. Census, which is something less than, than the salary of many of our teachers. Again, there was discussion last week about the education levels of folks in town, and I think with lower levels of education often means less in earnings. The Common Core State Standard Curriculum is a higher level of intensity than what we have expected of our children in the past. For sure, that is true for the younger grades. There's no, re no comparison of today's kindergarten expectations for those of earlier generations, or even seven years ago. It's an apples to apple pie kind of comparison. To say that half-day kindergarten was good enough for me and my kids, it's good enough for yours, is just not reasonable. Sure, I had half-day kindergarten in 1975, but I was expected to learn my colors and my shapes, not reading, writing, and arithmetic. Those were for first and second grade, which of course was a full-day program. We spend so much money on remediation and retention because our kids aren't making the grade, but the longer we wait to implement a stronger foundation, the more expensive it gets every year. Today's preschoolers are doing the work of kindergartens in the past. Just using the term nursery school demonstrates a misunderstanding of the learning that's done by those very young children. And last, I heard a lot of talk last week about poor parenting, that children should be free to explore their world and learn that way, that parents are, shouldn't be so lazy and should take responsibility for their children that it isn't society's job to take care of these children, and I've heard again and again and again, children should be home with their mothers. <clears throat> I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I don't know what decade these people are living in. Mayberry was fictional. I'm as nostalgic as anyone for life in a simpler time, but the good old days are gone. In 2013, our children don't stay out exploring the world until the streetlights come on, comfortable in the knowledge that the neighborhood is looking out for them. Fighting for a quality education for your children is one example of responsible parenting, and our moms are at work. 30 seconds, Jennifer. Thank you. It's very difficult in today's world to be a stay-at-home mother, take it from someone in the trenches, and for better or worse, our <coughs> families look different today than they used to. Saying that it shouldn't be this way doesn't change the reality that it is. So as you're making your decisions about how to fund Enfield's child children's education, I ask that you consider these ideas as well and consider closing that gap between what the Board of Ed says that they need to keep services at today's level and add full day in kindergarten rather than forcing them to cut teachers and services and their initiatives. Thanks. Thank you. Public communications, lady in the pink. Hello, I'm Joanne Jambard. I live at 19 Still Lane in Enfield. And this is the first time I've ever came in front of you. But it's a matter that is now getting to the point where it's unbearable living on the road that I live on. And I live on a road that's not ever has been paved. I lived there for 29 years, OK? And my road where I live has never been reconstructed or redone. And we have farm use that has used that road continuously all summer long, all the way up into the fall months. It is so bad that it is big holes down to the dirt. And it's to the point where you bring it into your driveway, you bring it, it's all over our lawns. And I know that we were on the 2010 road schedule, but now I have spoke to Mayor Copen and, and I see that I've received that email regarding now we could be pushed up to 2014. And I think that's unacceptable. Our road is what, a merely quarter mile long. 
And since I've lived on that road, we have Charlie Road that has been redone completely. We have Laughlin Road, who was also on the 2010 schedule, I believe, has already been, re has been paved, which was a dirt road, and I feel that Still Lane is being <coughs> overlooked. And we have a neighbor across the street, we have four houses on that road. The neighbor across the street is selling it, and he's had three buyers already says they would not buy it because of our road, and that's a shame. So I really do hope that it's not gonna wait until 2014 to be redone. And that's what I have to say. And I have heard from numerous people through the town, which I don't wanna say he say, he she say, but I've been told that if you are a council member, your road will get done quicker. So I have been told by police officers, by Enfield officials, and if that's the truth, shame on all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and, and just stick around because there's a Rhodes 2010 presentation <laughs> tonight. Uh, public communications, yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Marie Pisner. I live at 25 Roy Street here in Enfield. Born and raised in this town, I'm here tonight to talk about the proposed budget cuts to your Enfield daycare center. My mom, Celia Siraco, lives at Mark Twain. She's been there for almost four years. It's a marvelous place. And when I placed mom there, the most wonderful thing that happened was the Enfield Daycare Center. It has come to my attention that you are looking at cutting staff. I can tell you that during my mom's three and a half years in attendance there, she has been well cared for and the quality of care there I, I cannot even speak highly enough of. On two separate occasions, I got phone calls at work from the nurse Kathleen there. One occasion, they transported my mom to the hospital and they found that she was short of having heart failure because her potassium levels were off. If it wasn't for Kathleen to notice that my mom's legs were swollen and her breathing was off, she wouldn't be here today. On a second occasion, I got a phone call. Marie, I don't like the way mom looks today. I left work, brought her to her doctors, and she had fluid around her heart and her lungs. Mom is 85 and goes there four days a week. It is the best four days of her life. By cutting staff there, it's like cutting, okay, I'm gonna go backwards. I sat in this chamber when my kids were in school and I fought with the council. And it's the same thing. Now I have a mom that I'm fighting for. Just like these moms are fighting for kindergarten, which I'll put in my two cents, I think it should be full day. Um, I'm fighting for a mom and for other seniors that are in this town. This has been a vital program. You cut staff, you're gonna cut them looking at the an 85, 95, whatever the age group is, they go there every day, they see them, they get to know them, it's extended family. I work full time, all of you work full time. If any of you are primary caregivers to an elderly parent, you know what I'm talking about. You can go visit them, you can call them, but it's not the same as somebody looking after them every single day for you. They realize, I have called them to say, you know what, mom seems a little disoriented. When she comes today, can you check her out for me? Can you tell me if she's, if she's participating? Can you see if, if there's anything I need to worry about? And they're there for me. I have come to rely on them as daycare providers, just as I relied on people when my children, I relied on their teachers. So I am here to beg you, please, if you can find a way in this budget, we need to continue this staff as it is. One day they may have 21, one day they may have 16. But if you cut staff and you have a day of 21, then you're short people. Their numbers are going to rise again. They're an awesome program. So I am here, please begging you, consider not cutting any staff from this program. Their trips, somebody, just go visit. Go talk to the, if my mom is 85, let me tell you something right now. If I could have gotten her up these steps, Scott, you've been there when we've been there for yeah. family dinners. Cindy, you've been there. My mother glows. 
And trust me, it's not easy to make my mother glow. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, up, I'm right up front and honest here, okay? <laughs> um, but I have to tell you, go there and see what these people do. My hats go off to them to spend your day surrounded by our senior community and give what they give. And, and it goes beyond, I mean, <sighs> You know, it, it goes beyond. They check on her even when she's not there. I can just tell you, please, as a taxpayer in this town, for the last, mm -mm, I don't want to tell you how many years, okay, I want to see my tax dollars go for two things. I want to see it go for kids, and I want to see it go for our seniors. The rest of us can kind of take care of ourselves. 30 so, seconds, Marie. I appreciate your time. Please consider it. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Public communications. Pam. I'm also a first time speaker in front of the council and I, since I heard this information, I haven't slept. Um, so let me start off, I'm sorry, Pamela Mills, resident of 9 Hartford Avenue, Thompsonville. I am here tonight speaking in favor of maintaining full funding of the Enfield Adult Daycare Center. It has come to my attention that due to the town manager's budget, two positions are in jeopardy of being cut, a nurse position and an aide position. I feel strongly that these cuts would be ill-advised. I am a member of the sandwich generation, combining work, family, and coordination of care for elderly family members. I have sought out almost every different modality available to help with five different immediate family members. I have in the past four years utilized hospitals, short-term rehab, respite care, in-home care from VNA and physical therapy, companion care, hospice care, Meals on Wheels, October Kitchen, and lastly the services of the Enfield Adult Daycare Center. I am also a registered nurse working in an acute care hospital, so I look at all of these services with a very critical eye as to whether the care provided at each of these levels meets my standards. I have utilized the services of the Adult Daycare Center for the care of my elderly aunt for the past three years. I have sought out their services after my mother died at age 69, leaving her two older sisters, now age 72 and, I'm sorry, 78 and 82. This left my 78-year-old aunt to provide meals, medication administration, personal care, as well as care of household bills, upkeep on the house, snow shoveling, and everything else that comes with the home that they have owned and lived in on Prospect Street since the mid-1950s. In order to allow both of them to remain in their house while giving the younger sister a break from 24-hour supervision of her older sister, I looked to the services provided at the Beach Road location. From the first day I brought her there, we were welcomed with open arms and the care she has received there has been exemplary. We are greeted each day by name like one of the family. The staff take her by the hand, settle her down to a table where she receives a morning snack and they tell her what plans they have for her that day. For a very reasonable daily fee, she is supervised by competent, caring staff who provide what could never be equaled at home alone. She is provided personal care via a shower by a certified nursing assistant health screening by a registered nurse, including weights monitored monthly, which allows me to determine whether she's, her nutritional status is maintained. Recreational therapy via knitting, arts and crafts, bingo, dominoes, as well as field trips. Physical therapy via exercise group, cognitive therapy through trivia games, Jeopardy, and other memory games. She is provided nutritional meals, supervised cooking and baking opportunities, as well as many interactions with preschool children and grade school groups. The list goes on and on. All of these services, if sought individually, would be impossible to afford. Just as an example, the previous services I have experienced and used have included VNA, nursing and physical therapy not covered by Medicare after very few visits, companions and homemakers for one shower per week which is at an additional cost. Meal preparation and conversation eight hours a day has been in the excess of $750 a week, also not covered by Medicare. Meals on Wheels, approximately a $5 donation daily, 
but you must be present for deliveries daily between the hours of 10 and 1 p.m. or the food will not be delivered. This ties a person to the house waiting for deliveries. Respite care at a nursing facility so that a caregiver can go out of town. Self-paid at $1,200 for a weekend and they require a minimum of three to four nights stay. This is also based on availability of beds, which cannot be guaranteed until the day needed to drop your loved one off. For a $71 fee, daily fee, I have the peace of mind knowing that my aunt is being cared for by skilled, loving, concerned individuals who go out of their way to make sure not only are they providing every need for my family member, they also show concern for my welfare and how they can assist me through caregiver support groups and information on senior bus pickups so I don't have to drive her to the facility, which I do anyway. 30, 30 seconds, yep, Pam. I've got one more sentence. Incidentally, my nurse's eye has noticed that every trip to and from the daycare includes a certified nurse's aide to assist with any personal care needs during the ride. And I'm going to stop here, and I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Public communications. I think I saw the gentleman in the plaid shirt right behind Pam. Good evening. My name is William Palmberg. I've been a business person and property owner in town for the past 12 years. My address is 264 Hazard Avenue. My wife was in a daycare for six and a half years. The best care in the world. Can't speak highly enough. I also like to mention that I believe half of her, half of the budget for the daycare is from client fees. So as the client fees, client goes up, the fees go up, and it, it's less money for the town. And I, I just hope that the town does not <coughs> cut any positions in the daycare. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmberg. Public. Communications, yes, ma'am, in the gray t shirt. Yes. Hi, Andrew Fontana, Six Windsor Court. Uh, I prepared something, but uh, leaving it aside, working there for four years, I know how the clients are treated. They are not clients, they are part of a family. They are treated as if they are their own mothers and fathers there. And I firmly believe I was taught from when I was that high. We take care of our kids and we take care of our elderly. We do not throw them to the wayside on it. If a CNA was eliminated, as Bill just said, there's a CNA on a bus coming in and going home. That would leave one CNA at the facility to take care of whoever was there, which is an impossibility. Because when a client has to use the restrooms, you can't tell them, wait 20 minutes, I'll be right there. These people have Alzheimer's. They have different physical handicaps. They cannot sit there like you or I and wait. And with one CNA on call, it's not going to happen. And they're, who's going to suffer for it is the client. And then eventually, I believe that the caregivers of the client would withdraw them from the facility on it. The th thing with the daycare, it's, I believe it's the biggest kept secret in Enfield. Because if you mention a daycare, the only one they think of is Sister Pat. If you say, no, it's the Enfield daycare, they'll say it's Mark Twain. And it's not Mark Twain. So I really believe some advertisements are needed. And something in the, in the form of advertising for the daycare to get more clients in us. That's what it, it involves to keep the staff as is. And as far as an RN, yeah, Paula is an RN, but Paula is also the director. And she has so much on her plate right now. If Paula's at a meeting, there's no RN if you eliminate an RN. There has to be one there. Even if somebody passes out, there has to be an RN on it. And that's all I want to say, because I know it's a great place. And if I still had my mom, I wouldn't hesitate to bring her. OK, thank you. Thank you, Angie. <coughs> Public communications, lady in the pink. You. 
folks in the back, I'm just I'm kind of moving towards the back, so we'll we'll get to you. Hi, my name is Diane Stelmet. My address is 18 Clear Street, Enfield, and I too am a first-time speaker here at the council. Um, I am here today as a lifelong Enfield resident, taxpayer, registered and active voter, self-sufficient citizen, and most importantly, <clears throat> a doctor, a daughter, and caregiver to my elderly father. My father has lived with me for over four years since the death of my mother. He is an Alzheimer's patient with various health issues. And in the past few months, his health has declined and now requires 24-hour care. My father has been part of the Enfield Adult Day Center family for approximately three years. If this assistance were not available, I would be unable to work. I am a single mother and grandmother, pleading with you to continue the financial assistance to this very vital program. This wonderful program allows me to leave my father under the care of registered nurses and personalized care he needs. The Enfield Adult Day Center allows me comfort and support to stay in the wor workforce. Without this program, I am sure I would be a burden to the town of Enfield and to the state of Connecticut. My understanding at this time is to cut the financial assistance to this program, resulting in the loss of one registered nurse and one certified aide. This cannot happen. Losing a registered nurse would put the medical aspects of my father and others in jeopardy. This portion of the wonderful and necessary care they receive, for example, dispensing of medications only can be done by a registered nurse, would fall 100% on Paula, the director of the center. As the director, Paula has a tremendous workload keeping the center open. Under her direction, the Enfield Adult Day Center has maintained 100% accreditation and maintains a safe, social, and home-style environment for my father personally and all their clients. I really hesitate to divine those at the center as clients because they really are a family. The loss of a certified aide would also put many aspects of my father's care in question. First and foremost would be safety. My father, along with others in this family, need assistance with their daily functions, including eating, walking, the personal hygiene, and transportation. The loss of a certified aid would create a very unsafe environment. This would not be acceptable. As a 50-something-year-old <laughs> lifelong citizen of Enfield, I would welcome this program into my life as I approach the golden years. Please do not jeopardize this program. Good job. <laughs> okay, this is the hard part. Kathleen, help me. <laughs> I, I can't get through this. Go ahead, you do it. Okay. The last As one. As I close, I would like to get a bit personal. As hard as this is to share with tears in my eyes, I would like to share this final thought. My dad recently has been placed at hospice care. Hospice has been fabulous with specialized end-of-life care, but, and this is a big but, the Enfield Adult Day Center has been outstanding and comforting to me. The entire staff has made it possible for my dad to keep his family at the center, a part of his changing life. Please keep this program alive and running. I need it. Others need it. Enfield needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Public communications. Okay, we'll move uh, lady in the back with the pink. Pink's a popular color tonight. <laughs> Hi, my name is Debbie Moody, 62 Belmont, and I'm assistant project director for Mark Twain Congregate Dining Facility. We have many residents that attend adult daycare on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them don't have families that are local. Some of their families are very far away. So this is the only socialization they get during the week. Otherwise, they're in their room. And whether or not they're acclimated to time and socialization skills, this is all they'll get. Um, it's very important to maintain a sense of community as you grow older. 
just as it is to instill that in our youth. Um, and I understand that we have huge challenges. And I, I wrote a little thing so I would be organized, so I'm going to do that because I tend to get disorganized. Um, and I've been a lifelong resident except for two years. I moved back though, so I was in Windsor for two years and came back here, but I've lived here pretty much all my life. So I've seen our town experience many changes. Lately, it seems unending. We have mandates from the federal and state that bring challenges that we have to make and meet. Then there are challenges and events that create a sense of urgency or radical change to our life, starting with 9-11, then Columbine, then inner city violence, home invasions, new town, Boston as of late. And that's just unfortunately a few of the traumatic events that have brought around radical changes to our lives and how we govern ourselves as a people and community. We also have our social difficulties as in any other community, some more or less. We have legal and illegal drug trafficking and addiction, bullying, violence in our cities and our homes, and suicide. These issues are not small issues. They are large, far-reaching, and have lasting impact on communities for generations. They change us. They change us as a people, as a culture, in our neighborhoods. With all my heart, I believe every person can teach us something if we choose to learn. I have yet to meet anyone who has not taught me something, whether it be good or bad. A young child, a teenager, someone rich, someone poor, someone at the top of the ladder, at the bottom of the barrel, I have learned something from them. We all can learn from each other. Therefore, to be inclusive, not exclusive, is very important. And to be unassuming leaves more to be learned than to assume that we all know what is best. There's a new concept I wish we could look at. It's called a hackathon. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of it. It's being used in big business. It's a way to have people come together um, to create more than just one or two or three ideas to solve problems. Google uses it, Facebook uses it, a lot of Fortune 500s. You gather people of all different demographics within your community. It can be applied to communities. I sincerely believe it can be. Um, and also, it would include the next generation that is coming forward. That generation is completely left out of the process. They're frustrated and it shows. They are the silent majority. We have a middle-aged silent majority that's not being heard now that is frustrated and has, is leaving the area. They're going south. We want our communities to stay strong and supportive. And in order to do so, we have to hear from everyone. We have the youngest generation that is so tech savvy, so bright and brilliant that thinks out of the box. Hackathons, what they do is instead of getting ideas from maybe three or four or five, six, seven specialists, you have 10, 20 teams at times of people in teams of 10 or 20 people with varying ideas. And it's a contest. And what you do is you gather these people to solve your problems. And it's like a marathon. It's a 24-hour brainstorming marathon. And it could be held at a college. It could be held at anywhere you could in town. And you would have a choice. And you could award them you know, a prize. I mean, you can award them you know, anything you want to, recognition. Here is a certificate of recognition. You came up with a plan that moved infield in another direction. You have choices, more choices than what we're having now. Our budgets are so tight. I believe the more choices that we have, the better informed will all be, and I wish you would look into maybe something a little different. I think our government is not able to keep up with the pace of change. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Public communications. Margaret. Please. Sure. Margaret Jardiniak, Abbey Road, Enfield. By reading the agenda, I notice that you are forming a committee to study developing a community center. You must be anticipating spending additional money on that program. If this is true, surely you can support the senior adult daycare. It should be a bigger priority than that. 
and you should think of the seniors and we ask for so little help. And I thought you could spare just a little for the seniors. If it wasn't for my two daughters taking me on as caregivers, I'd be going to the adult daycare now. <laughs> for 92 years, I have not asked Enfield for any help at all. And my family is doing it all now. And the rest of the people that have to go into the, into the nursing homes, I would like you to go and visit the nursing homes and see what happens to these people there. Nobody wants to go to the nursing home. And I look at you now, and one of these days, you're gonna be there. And you may end up there too. So just think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Jack, you're next. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, Jack Sheridan, 7 Buchanan Road. And this is not my first time before you. Um, I've heard some pretty compelling arguments tonight on the various uh, presentations. But I know that this particular uh, adult daycare was started with a grant. And once it became a, a paying proposition, then you can support something like that. And I think the lady that said that you need to advertise it better would probably be a viable option. But that said, revenue and spending has to be weighed by all of you for everybody. And if you, if you raise revenue to support all of the wants of everybody in town, then you're going to drive business and taxes will drive business out. So it's a balance that you have to be aware of. And if businesses go, then people go because they're employed by these businesses. And it's, it's a never-ending process. Uh, seniors only have a certain limits. Um, I've been retired since 99. I haven't gotten a raise since 1999. So, you know, whatever you do, it's going to affect seniors. And the more you affect this thing, uh, the school budget needs to be cut. You need to control more or, or concentrate more on academics and forget all the extracurricular stuff. If we're down, what I need to have from any organization, any group of people, is tell me where to cut. Tell me what you're willing to do away with some service. Because you can't keep taxing the businesses and the people. It can't keep happening. And if, if the minimum budget requirement on, on imposed on the school system, we're down by 2,400 students in the last 12 years, and yet we have to increase the budget every year by that minimum budget requirement. We can't continue to do that. And I, I honestly think that the people on these committees that get together, they're being duped by the, by the school organization that says that we need all of these things and we, we need these classrooms when it's obvious that by the time they even open the doors to the new school, there's going to be a lot fewer kids. And what that suggests, and I'd like you to put this on record and make sure you keep this in mind, everybody here tonight, I'll guarantee that when this thing is done and we have more open seats than students, they'll be busting them in from Hartford. And we know what happens. We know what happened at JFK. We're not going to lay teachers off. We're going to, the teacher organization wants to stay whole. So what are you going to do? Bus in and fill the seats? It's not a good idea. It, it, we can't overbuild anything. No business builds itself when the customers are depleting. It doesn't happen. So I, I need, the other thing, last week in the Hartford Current, it said that um, they did a study, and I'm not sure now because I, but they did a study and said that after the third grade, there was no sign of any improvement with pre-care pre or, or kindergarten after three years. 
So if, if, if they're cutting, if New York is cutting that, then they have a money squeeze too. So all I'm saying is, if you, if you need money to support, and I think there's some very viable things that people have said here tonight, but, but cut out some of the extracurriculars then. It costs a fortune. One thing I know is that if you look at all of the students that are taking these extracurriculars, whether it be football or music or whatever end of that spectrum it is, they're pretty much the same group of kids. You have kids that, even though it shows like there might be 300 kids that take extracurricular, there's re or 300 fills for those positions, there's only like 150 kids. They're just in them two or three times. So all that extra money that we're spending to, to support those things is being used by such a small group of the population that I think that needs to be looked at. And the lady that said, sit down and, and cumulatively come together with those things and, and, and try and sort out, rather than just do what the federal government does and raise taxes, print money. We can't print money, so there's no money tree. And, and this 30, grant- 30 seconds, Jack. Okay, uh, I, I, let me make sure I get <laughs> my- <laughs> Guess what? I hit them all. You hit them all? <laughs> Thank you. With two seconds to spare. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Jack. Public communications. Okay, I'll let you two pick. Is it Mr. Moriarty or Mr. MyJack first? My name is Steve Moriarty, 24 Cedar Drive here in lovely Enfield, Connecticut. Uh, whatever me and Jeff did, we're sorry. Uh, now, it, last week, uh, I had to cut down a tree on my property, and to get rid of it, I filled up uh, the brown tipper barrel. And since I'm uh, very good with my trash, I had no, nothing in that, so I, I tried getting by. I know the policy. You only use the brown tipper barrel. I put it in the gray tipper barrel and I got a nice green note saying, uh-uh, don't do that. I know we've uh, discussed this before and I think it's something we should uh, call up again. It gives us plenty of time before the fall leaf season comes <coughs> upon us. Uh, there are people that are more conscious about recycling and reducing their, their trash. And my trash is picked up on Wednesday twice a year, every, you know, I, I just keep it that that good, but many times it, it's just empty. It's been empty for three weeks now, so I figure I'd try. And what I suggest, though, is that if we can use those, just for me to, for my house, just put a little note on there saying it's all it's all leaves or it's all branches, it's all yard waste. Put the date on it so they can take it off so that it's a one-time use for that sheet. Now, I was talking to someone today uh, that deals with the collections, and she said, uh, well, we, we can't do that. I said, well, let, let's think about it for a, for a little bit. And I, I said, well, this helps uh, the, the people that are on the truck. They don't, they don't have to pick up, you know, 20 bags. She goes, well, you know, that's the way it's going to be, and they might limit the number of bags because they have you know, people getting injured because they're lifting up all the leaves and I'm thinking something ain't right there. I just gave her a, a, a viable solution and she says I can't use it because it works. It, it's going to prevent those guys from picking up another 20 bags of leaves or yard waste so why not do it? I, it's, I understand the problem. There are people in this community that just don't understand. And no matter how, how hard you hit them with a baseball bat, they still won't understand. It's, but why penalize the many people, and there's been other people that come up here saying, you know, we're doing great things, let's do more for uh, recycling, uh, for cleaning up our town. Why hold it against those good people that there are a few bad people? Just something as simple as a note that's visible, you, you all can see this, and it says, okay, today it's all leaves. Then if you find some trash in there, throw it on their lawn. What the heck? 
and all these things I bring up, uh, whether it's you know this the tipper barrels or the crosswalks or bike routes, they are all either low cost or no cost. I know that makes people happy. Uh, and it's not just for me, it's for the people in the community, it's, it's for the employees of the town, it keeps them healthy, it keeps our environment nice. And th that's you know the, the ultimate uh, reward for this, is having a nice, healthy environment where people can go around, do their thing, and just be happy about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Jeff, you're next. Uh, Jeff Majak, 3 Sharp Street in Enfield. Uh, it's a little warm in here tonight in case you haven't noticed. Uh, before you tonight, you're going to have uh, a request for an energy performance contract. And while I haven't seen all the specifics, I do know a little bit about uh, energy performance contracts. Enfield is a, is a member of several organizations, CCM, CROG, and CLNP. And CLNP has also bid out many of these same projects you're looking to do tonight with some fantastic results. The thing about energy performance contracts, you need to have a third party looking them over, making sure that you're getting what you're paying for, monitoring it, and making sure you're getting the right financing. Uh, where I work at Pratt & Whitney, we use a company called Celtic Energy. They come in, they look at what we need, they make suggestions to us, they arrange the financing we need, but they don't do the work. They're a hands-off, Third party, they monitor it, make sure we get what we're paying for. Uh, tonight, who is your third party that's going to be monitoring this? Uh, it's a question I have for you. I also wonder who's financing this project tonight? Um, again, you should have one company financing it, validating it, making sure you're getting your money's worth. Otherwise, you've got the fox watching over the hen house if you guys have the same company doing all the activities. Um, when you hear your numbers tonight, I want to give you some reference points. Tolland recently replaced their entire HVAC system in Town Hall. Heating, air conditioning, duct work, they're getting a 13 and a half year payback on their system. I'll be curious to hear what you're going to get tonight just on a boiler. Uh, most offices are replacing their lighting with T5 lighting. These here look to be T8s, probably using 88 watts of electricity. T5s will use about 59 watts of electricity. You got a two and a half to four year payback on those systems. I know Jonathan at the Public Works Department has a project sitting in front of him, a 30 month payback. Hopefully he can get it pushed through. And again, you use a less electricity, it's gonna cost you less, gonna generate less heat. Wouldn't that be nice to have a little cooler room here tonight? Uh, last year, CCM brought you a proposal for solar. While area, uh, towns, businesses, we're paying about six cents a kilowatt through these proposals. Glastonbury High School, perfect example. Six cents a kilowatt. They're covering the roof of the high school. That's what they're gonna pay, six cents a kilowatt. The town elected to go with uh, Sun Edison, I believe it was, and pay eight cents a kilowatt. Where is that project gone? Mr. Nelson had uh, expressed concerns that the Clean Energy Committee was gonna come before this council asking us to spend money on energy projects because you had signed up for the Clean Energy Pledge. This is a project we would not be coming and asking you to spend money on. I'd ask you to take a look at the CLMP program. There are area contractors that will do the job for less. I'd also ask you to look at other area companies like Rich's Oil, D&D, &D, and see what they can do for you for a boiler keep the business local. We go looking to them for donations, for support and charity organizations. Why not look to them to give them some business? See if they're competitive. Um, another project that I would recommend the town forego right now is the Brainerd Park project. I understand that's about a $40,000 project. There's a lot of groups around this town looking to do projects. We had a group that did the dog park. Woodside Park was done a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there was Homestead was doing homes around the town. There's a lot of groups willing to do stuff. See if somebody will step up and do that for the town. It gives people a good feeling to be doing things for the town. Use that money towards the senior center. 
uh, the folks have been talking about here tonight. Um, lastly, somebody earlier was mentioning the Roads 2010 project. My road was set to be done in 2005, ran out of money. It got put onto the Roads 2010 project. It was anticipated to be done in 2012. We're in 2013, it's still not done. I'm gonna be curious to hear when my street will be done. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Public communications. Mr. Tkaz. No. No. Bob Tkaz, 12 Elm Street. That data on the uh, <clears throat> high school level education, <clears throat> somebody said 40%. Actually, for 2011, in fact, the population of Enfield declined from 2010 to 2011. Um, it's, it's actually 35%. Now, people with some college, people with bachelor's degree and more, but you add everything up, this is over 25 now. That's how they do the census data. It's 92%. We're ahead of the state. The state's 89%. 29% for high school education in the state of Connecticut. Uh, talk with my dentist, who's South Korean. We discussed the educational system. By the way, Asia is far ahead of us in education. Um, he told me the philosophy of how the Asians look at problems. They don't take one side or the other, they look at the whole picture. But there's one thing that they don't have, and they're way ahead of us. They don't have kindergarten. If you want to go to kindergarten, you have to pay for it. But most parents in Asia feel that kindergarten is not necessary and it doesn't help the education system. Now, if you look at Long Meadow, Long Meadow's going through the same thing as Enfield's going through. In fact, there's a town meeting tomorrow night, the uh, select board, the select board, I think it's, or the select committee, wants to level fund both the town side and the education side. Then they came up with a compromise to give the school board, not school board, school committee, half of what they're asking for. Well, that motion failed three to two. Now they're going to the town meeting to hash it out tomorrow night. Um, they feel the select, select, the select men or select board feel that they want to level fund their budget. They're losing students in their school system like we are. The, it, it's in decline because of the economy. We have a lot of businesses that are out of business. We have many storefronts that, Enfield Street's dying. Thompsonville is dead. We have, to, we have to have programs to revive that area. Uh, in Rocky Hill, the superintendent is going to hire armed guards at $20 an hour. He had many, many applicants. So why are we proposing paying $27 or $25 an hour when you can get all the applicants you need at $20 an hour? I don't understand where we're going. Uh, we need to uh, level fund both the school side and the town side. And thank you. Thank you, Bob. Public communications? Anyone else for the first time? Buster. Good evening, Buster Young and Lori Dry. I'm here tonight, and I think one of the council members up there will know. Right, Tom? Um, litter. I hate to say, I go out and walk for me frequently. Saturday, I went out to get my daily walk in around the football field. What I saw was disgusting. 
I'm going to agree with that fellow that spoke about tipper barrels. Out at Fermi High, there's quite a few barrels. But go out there and see how these young kids litter that field with water bottles, which you gentlemen and what ladies up there are using. I don't know why it isn't announced before the games. Please use the tipper barrels or the recycle barrels to put these water bo bottles in. This is a disgrace to go out there and see this trash that's at that school. I was very surprised to see that Saturday. Also, I am going to bring up again for maybe the umpteenth time, plight. We got the worst plight in this town. I, where I live, I have a neighbor that has thrown out trash, couches, and the other day I noticed he brought his pickup truck with wooden fence and added to the pile. In the meantime, there was a house down at the end of Robin uh, Lorry and to Robin Drive. These people put some trash out. In two days, it was gone. Now, I just don't know, and I've heard this from many people, and this is from my own wife. $100 to pick up this trash is outrageous. I think you'll get more of a response if you came back down to about $50. People will. I see people throwing televisions out to try to get rid of. I got a neighbor on Till Street. He's in the contracting business. He brings trash home. Is laying against the garage. You can see it. People are cutting down trees. They're putting them in the yard. What does this say for Enfield? This is, says we're a trash town, as far as I'm concerned. We got to do something with this plight situation because they don't seem to care in this town. They're going to litter. Until you bring this price down, you're going to have litter all over this town. And that doesn't give good representation for this town of Enfield. Thank you. Thank you, Buster. Public communications, anyone else for the first time? Pam, second. Thank you. You're welcome. Pam Mills, Hartford Avenue. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get it under five minutes. I went six minutes and 12 seconds, and Scott wouldn't let me go right. on. <laughs> OK, so I left off. Um, with any budget cuts to this program, Enfield Adult Daycare, would, in my opinion, adversely impact the quality of care, supervision, and safety provided to our most vulnerable residents of this town. I received a call from staff when they have noticed a minor rash on my aunt's chest during her shower and another when they noted a slight change in her balance. She was immediately evaluated by the nurse there, blood pressure and vitals checked, and notified me with their assessment. And as someone said before, when she doesn't come, they call me. Is she okay? Is there anything we can do for you? And that really is, you know, it's really very heartwarming. If you cut the proposed positions, you would be reducing the staffing to one nurse, who is also the director, and two aides who would be responsible for all the personal care, toileting, medical supervision, ambulation, and safe transfers. The director of the program would be pulled away from her administrative duties, maintaining updated medical records, grant acquisitions, and numerous other duties that I can only imagine to keep the program compliant with federal and state mandates. She would be required to be the only licensed medical individual overseeing and as an active participant in all aspects of personal care provided. I would prefer that she was not required to choose between client care and keeping the program viable. And another thing I think was brought up is that if you have one RN there and she's sick, she's on vacation, she can't make it in because of snow, they cannot open. You must have an RN there. 
Um, I can only speak from experience with this program. Oh, let me state, say, if someone goes down, how long are we going to have to wait until EMS can make it there? And we've got one nurse, and I've done CPR, and you don't last more than a couple of minutes. You are exhausted. You cannot continue. Um, I can only speak from my experience with this program. I have watched my aunt go from basically a mushroom who stayed in her dark room, coming out only for meals, essentially nonverbal, just waiting to die, who also was virtually in, not even touched, okay? She was touched, not even touched, not in, in, you don't understand what the, just touching someone, what that can do for someone. The first few months that she attended, she would sit quietly in the car, fearful and staring straight ahead. I would have to ask her questions just to pull out of her what she did, kind of like you have to do with kids. What did you eat for lunch? What games did you play? Now when I pick her up, she gives me the jewelry that she's made for me. She tells me about the cute kids that came from daycare. I won this at Domino's. And then she proceeds to tell me, you just ran that red light, you know. <laughs> um, she wouldn't have seen that before. The other aunt at home tells me how when she comes now, she doesn't go to her room. She stays out and reads the paper, watches TV, and seems more engaged and animated. She's out there talking. My nieces and nephews come over. She's talking with the kids. Um, she didn't do that before. She stayed in a room. She didn't even talk. I believe that the Enfield Adult Daycare has prolonged her life, and if you should, and should you ever need their services for your family or even yourself, let us hope that they will be there for you just as they have been for me and my family. I challenge each and every one of you on the council to visit them and see the wonderful work they do. I also encourage you to refrain from cutting these vital positions and in fact, why don't you increase their funding while you're at it? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pam. Did you get it all, Mackenzie? Did you get it all, Mackenzie? <laughs> <laughs> Public communications, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Debbie, I believe. Debbie. Debbie Moody from 62 Belmont Avenue. Again, I would like to reemphasize with all of the issues that are at hand with the growing population of elderly that is just going to live longer and longer and longer and need more assistance that you look at options other than what is just clearly before us. Get together professionals, get together people that have innovative thinking, brainstorm, come up with fresh ideas, streamline what needs to be done in this Department of Social Services for the elderly because our, our population is much older. It needs, to, it needs to be addressed. It's not gonna go away. And if anything, it will increase. And if you cut funding, you will have very severe cases of people that are neglected, left alone, malnourished. You know, you're gonna end up finding people in very poor condition. And that's not what we want for our community. And being a caregiver on my other part-time job of the elderly, and I go to people's homes, and it is a per hour charge, and I go through an agency, I will tell you firsthand that there is a huge need to expand the adult daycare program and maybe put another one in another area of town on top of it <laughs> and increase meals to these people. You know, think about when you have company and you go to make a meal for yourself. Just a few people. Now think of you living alone having one leg, not being able to see, even what you're reaching for, and trying to get to the grocery store just to get the food. <laughs> Never mind, prepare it. And you have a caregiver that comes in for two hours, maybe once or twice a week. And they have to bathe you, get you dressed, do your washing, do your floors, do your grocery shopping, get your medicine, make sure you're taking it properly. 
Cook meal? Maybe, if you get to it. Adult daycare is a very viable solution to an ever-growing problem and should not even be touched. And thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie. Public communications? Yes, Marie. Okay. Sitting here and listening to everybody, something came up. Need you to state your name and address. Oh, Marie again. Pisner, 25 Roy Street, right here in Enfield. If you do an at home daycare, you have five children per adult, depending on the ages of the children. I think everybody here needs to go look at it, the day center. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but the elderly are like taking care of four year olds, okay? Anybody here who has an elderly parent who is suffering from an Alzheimer's, dementia, or any other type of severe health issue knows that we're going backwards. We're not going forward. So it's not like, okay, you have to go to the bathroom and they get up and go. That doesn't happen. You take them. And taking an 80 plus person to the bathroom is different than even taking a four year old to the bathroom. So if you have five people in a daycare per adult and you're saying Enfield Daycare can be cut and they've got 16 people there, you're coming up short. So I think that needs to be considered. These people need their help. My mom has some early dementia. She is not an Alzheimer's patient, but let me tell you, when I take her out, it's a full-time job just to get her to a restaurant, to have a lunch, to get her back in the car. I don't know how these women do it for a full day. It's a lot of work. And let me tell you, they do it with a smile on their face. You never go in there and see them angry or like, I can't wait to get out of here. Actually, I see a couple of them when they leave there go and help the clients that are living over at Mark Twain. So they're on double duty. These are people who love working with the elderly. They're good at it. So when you're looking at a, at a dimension of you know five to one for a child, it's not much different looking at the elderly. It's really not. So again, I guess it's just a plead. I pay my taxes. I'd like to see him go for two things, kids and elderly. Thanks again. Thank you, Marie. Anyone else, public communications? Margaret? Margaret Jadziniak, Abbey Road, Enfield. I think you all know and remember my husband. My husband was in the nursing home for about three months. And before he got out of there, he got to the point where he couldn't even go to the toilet by himself. Now you know what that comes to. All you have left is your pride and no man wants to go through that. So before he got out of there, he was begging us to let him die. So these are the things, if you don't have places for them to go to where they can get some care and the right people are looking after them. And like all these other women said, you better just think about it. And that's why I keep saying it. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Margaret. Public communications, anyone else? Thank you very much for, oh, sorry, Bob. Did not see your hand up. Sorry. Bob T. Katz, 12 Elm Street. You know, we seem to have an obsession of all this gun legislation. And it is an obsession because guns aren't effective, an effective weapon. 
in Boston, we saw we saw a more effective weapon, but those guys were amateurs. Uh, I had a meeting with a bunch of Vietnam veterans, and we discussed that. Um, Vietnam, well, start with Korea, we almost lost, we got pushed off the peninsula almost, and we lost that war. Indochina, Vietnam, we lost that war. We didn't have the weapons. But some of the, some of the Vietnam veterans made up their own weapons. <coughs> and the first ingredient is a stabilizing agent. You can use uh, ivory flakes. The second agent I won't name. You can buy it at any re retail store in Connecticut, in Enfield in Connecticut. And, and uh, then they used M80s. But you can use a cell phone today. Those could be brought in the back door of the schools. You got an armed guard watching the front door, and at 10 o'clock, they could make the phone call. The Vietnam veterans, uh, they were overrun like a thousand, thousand Chinese would overrun the camp. In 10 minutes, they would incinerate them. So that's, that's the magnitude of that weapon. Guns are nothing compared to what can be done with people that know what they're doing. So. We're, we're, we're not safe, and what we're proposing is not safety. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Public communications. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really an honor to address you. My name is Tom O'Brien. I live on Simon, uh, used to be Simon Road. I live on North Maple Street now, 18 North Maple. <laughs> and I'm here in support of adult daycare. The program is fantastic. Let me tell you something. You know, I never thought I'd be sitting here without being able to walk up to this microphone myself. But it's silly me I had a stroke. That would never happen to me. It's been the history of my life to have these weird illnesses hit me and just drive me back off my feet. And if it could happen to me, everyone, it can happen to you. And believe me, if it happens to you, you want adult daycare there for you also. Because it is such a wonderful place to go. I got off the bus going to daycare one day. And greeting me at the door was Kathleen, the nurse, with a big smile on her face, as she always has. And she's there, Tom, how you doing? I said, good, Kathleen, how was your day? And she says, good. But uh, what's wrong? Are you all right? And I said, yeah, I think so. She says, Tom, you look like you're having an allergic reaction to something. Are you allergic to something? I says, I don't know. I'm allergic to half a dozen things. You know, like everybody else, I got my allergies. And she says, well, you, don't, you look like you're all, your face is all swollen. Well, unbeknownst to me, my wife had had a big buy on shrimp at the store <laughs> and I found out I was allergic to shrimp and uh, Tom you didn't see but everyone looked back at your wife <laughs> <laughs> well give her a good look because she's been making eyes at me she does not want me to talk here and pontificate I've started up here three times and finally she says to me why are you putting your hand up Put your hand down. <laughs> but to cut the program and cut the people, it really is not good. I mean, th this program, the way it works right now, the ladies bake. They make uh, cookies for the troops overseas. And the biggest problem they have is getting the money for the postage, right? I know the last package that was sent out, I think I gave in something like $4 just for the postage. 
because the ladies are so happy and proud. And they write a letter, and every once in a while, some of the troops come back and thank us for the cookies. But the town should recognize this is an integral part of the senior population of the town. We look forward to it. It's something we're proud of. And it's really something we're proud to take part in. And all I can say is up till now it's been wonderful. And thank you all very much for keeping it going. Please don't cut the funding. And I can't stress that please enough. I was so happy hearing all the good words that have come out about daycare. It is a great program. And right now, the way that it's set up, I don't think you could ever find a program to match it. I really mean that. Yeah, I've been bounced around in different nursing homes, too. And they are not any place you want to send people. They have very little regard for people there. My gate belt. Last time I went to a. Tell him he's done. Oh, tell him he's done. There's a reason why I almost didn't come up. I don't want you to go up there and start pontificating. <laughs> See, I wanted to bring to you uh, an idea of mine that I would be helpful. Uh, I would be helpful in implementing with you. And. Carol, if you could ever come over and see me, I can give you the ideas and I'll let you bring it back to the council. All right? I'm very proud of being in this town. I really am. I've been here for many years. I moved to town in, when I was in 1955. I went to uh, Enfield High School and I graduated in 64. Oh no, I'm sorry, 1960. The years are getting changing my mind. It's terrible. But once again, thank you very much for listening to me. It's been an honor coming in front of you and speaking. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else for public communications? Very good. Thank you all for your comments. We will go to Councilman Communications. I've got Councilman Kensler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple of things. Um, regarding the adult daycare, oh, everyone turn around and watch. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> No, regarding the adult daycare, I just wanted you to know that we have had heartfelt, serious discussions already and will continue to. Uh, I, I can't tell you how it's going to turn out, but I can tell you that your stories, we've already heard many of them, and uh, they do touch us, and we're going to try to figure out what we can figure out. So um, I don't want anybody to leave here with the impression that a decision's been made or anything, okay? And I just wanted to share that with you. <clears throat> okay, now you can get up. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of uh, Margaret had a question on the on the community center. I just want to know if through the mayor to Matt, if you could just elaborate on uh, the, her concern that we were spending money on a community center committee and that we should spend that money somewhere else. Just if you could sort of talk to that. Um, and then if you could address the, the tipper issue, um, maybe in a, a little recap for Steve. Uh, Patriot Award. Uh, if you see it's up on some of the sites, it's been out there in the newspaper. The Patriot Award is chosen every year for one person in the town of Enfield, nominated by somebody else uh, for that award that will be given out at the 4th of July town celebration. You can get applications on the 4th of July town celebration website or the town of Enfield website and they need to be in hand by May 31st so please if you know of a Patriot uh, don't hesitate um, 
and let's get those applications in there. I know last year we had several great candidates, and we want to have even more this year because I know we have a lot of patriots. And lastly, regarding energy, there's going to be a discussion later about energy, but I would ask that uh, maybe uh, through the mayor to Dan that we put an official memo out to the Clean Energy Committee um, asking them uh, if they would like to send representatives to the Energy Task Force meetings to observe that they would uh, get the time schedules for that, be in their public meeting, and there, therein they could get face-to-face uh, -face information as it's being discussed, and we could maybe take some of the uh, the guesswork out of their uh, um, their uh, beliefs in what's going on, and that would probably make it a little better. I would appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Tom. I got uh, Cindy next. Thank you. Just. Um, Wanted to bring forward a resident concern, um, I guess, and I should direct this to Matt, to our public works director. The section of asphalt is separating from the railroad tracks over Abbey Wood in that area where the tracks are laid. And <clears throat> apparently it's causing some serious issues for the people that live in that section. And along the same lines with that set of railroad tracks, I'd like to uh, request town staff, town manager, to provide a report perhaps after budget on where we are with the railroad tracks across town. I know at one point we were uh, looking um, you know, to work with the railroad company or railroad people to uh, get a resolution to the bumps and the jumps and you know all the mess that we have. I just want to follow up on that. But this particular issue, one resident um, made a point to um, seek me out to uh, show concern, and I think there are probably other people out there that have issues with that. Okay, and then I also um, do want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Joe. Uh, yeah, Steve, on the trash barrels, that's something I've been fighting for and arguing and complaining about, and. I guess people, they just figure people aren't res responsible enough not to leave their trash and putting the stuff on top of it. But it's something actually uh, Ken and I both tried for the longest time to get through. Uh, Matt, uh, through to mayor to the town manager, um, the transfer station. Uh, when we go up there to, uh, on yard waste, are, I know we're weighing it. Are we using it now for the tallies, the recycling numbers? And if we're not, I would had to pleasure of using it this weekend and Jonathan it looks beautiful down there it's at least as beautiful as a dump could look uh -huh. but we had lines all the way out past the dog park to get to dump yard waste and uh, unless we're using them numbers to uh, tally for recycling numbers uh, you know we could uh, it would be nice if we could let the uh, yard waste on high volume days bypass a scale and uh, maybe do a yardage calculation or a, a rough number of weight that we got in there because you know all the people were waiting and it, it took almost an hour in and out before you can come and uh, you know, it just there really is no need for it if we're not using them numbers to uh, get uh, money back or, or credits back for uh, recycling and um, on still lane uh, there are a bunch of roads out there that really we should be looking at doing before we do other roads. And uh, I think that we should be looking at the severity of the roads first. But I can tell you this much, um, on the council, it doesn't work. I had a move to get a road that was nice. <laughs> I had two big wazoos in front of my house that every time the trucks hit them, they, they made all kinds of noise. And never mind when they were mad at me, they used to plow the snow deeper on my sidewalks. So being on the council isn't all what it seems to be. And uh, I see Buster left, but if uh, people won't put the, their trash in a free receptacle, it doesn't matter what we charge, you're still going to dump the trash where they want. And um, I guess that's it for me. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Tom, you're next. Thank you. Um, full day kindergarten first. I'll come out with that. That, uh, you know, I do support it. And, um, you know, we live in a global society today. Uh, we're competing not only with 50 states, but we're also competing with the world. 
And uh, with that being said, in most parts of the world, and or a lot of parts of the world, the school days are longer than, than us. Uh, we have that in competition. Uh, and in some places, even they go year round. And in South Korea, they start school at three years old. And that is a many of the models, and they may not call it kindergarten, but they start at a very, very early age. So that's what we're up again as a, as a society, and we owe it to our children to get more education and more time in the classroom. And Matt, I live on Cartier Road. You want to get the uh, pavers <laughs> down there first thing in the morning. I'd appreciate that. And uh, Enfield Daycare also have my full support. And after what I've heard tonight, uh, you know, we have the right people in place, and God bless staff. Uh, Matt, I mean, what a tremendous uh, uh, people we have working for us. And, uh, you know, I, I think the program, and I need to go down and spend some time there myself to, uh, to see the program firsthand. You know, families have so much more pressure today. They have to work longer. They have to stay in the workforce longer. They need this help uh, just to pay the mortgage. So, uh, you know, you have my support. And uh, thank you for coming out and opening my eyes and what a great program we have. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Carol? Uh, through Scott to the town manager, uh, Matt, on Abbey Road, coming down to the, um, the Stoker's Corner on Powder Ridge, there's a, a ledge, part of the road is just dropped into his uh, yard almost. It's a huge, uh, you, you kind of have to swerve to the left side of the road to avoid kind of the car going into it and it's it was that way last year but it's gotten worse over the winter so if, if somebody from public works can can look at that um, it's getting pretty bad now um, and then everybody left for the adult daycare but I think Tom said it the best I, I think we're there's a lot of us up here I'll speak for myself personally but I got a, a quite a bit of emails and calls from folks that I I actually talked to Tom O'Brien twice, and he invited me over, which I will come, I promise. Um, but I did talk to a lot of people on this, and I definitely support a fully staffed adult daycare. And I know Joey is very passionate about it as well, and I, I'm sure there's quite a few of us up here that would support the full staff. So we'll see what we can do at budget. It's going to be a little tough, but we're going to... We're going to work some numbers, and hopefully we can make that happen for, for you folks. But that's where I stand on it, and I'd love to see it fully funded for those staff members. So I'll speak for myself on that one, but you've got a, a huge support group up here for it. So, um, And I think that's all I have. All right. Yes. Thank you, Carol. Councilman Stokes? Just just want to add in there, I uh, appreciate everybody coming. I know many of you had to go, though. But like was said, is that we've all had discussions about the adult daycare, and uh, um, and I think we've got support here if we want to make sure that our elderly are cared for. For myself, I, I lost my father-in-law a month ago to, to uh, dementia, and so I know the care that is needed uh, for the restrooms and things like that. For over a year, we took care of him, and so um, just wanted to say that many of us know exactly what you're talking about, what you've experienced. So, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Deputy Mayor Nelson. First, I'll say about the adult daycare. I personally feel nobody says it better than somebody who takes advantage of the program. You can have people who know people who use it. You can have employees. You can have other people come in and fight. But when you get somebody like Tom who comes up in front of you with a smile on his face, it really hits home. I, I have some um, very, very close people to me that... They're at home, they're elderly, they're not doing well, and I wish they would take part in a program like this because I think it would do wonders for them. And to see that man with a smile on his face, I mean, that's what life should be about. You know, you're in your golden years, you should be enjoying life right now. And because of him, I will state right now, I will support the change that Joey asked to put up on the board for adult daycare. He was the one who started it, he led it, and I will stand behind him 100% on it or I will be a no on the budget if that money is cut. So I make that commitment right now, and I give Tom the credit for it and Joey the credit for putting it on the board. That's how strong I am about that. And I'm really not with a lot of other programs because I'm going to go the total opposite way now with um, full-day kindergarten. People talk about full-day kindergarten, which I do support, but there's a lot of programs we have throughout the town of Enfield that have done the job 
that full day kindergarten is now going to do. I believe Kite takes part of that program. You have programs at the library. And we talk about programs that, you know, uh, we got three different programs doing the same thing. So maybe that's an idea we can look at those funding avenues and take some money from them and apply it towards the all-day kindergarten to help offset the cost. And I'm sure they're okay because they support the program also. They do the same thing. Jeff? I supported 100% when it went out for referendum. I think it was a huge mistake when the people of Enfield turned it down. We could be so much farther with our buildings right now. I agree with you. I'm behind this. I hope the uh, pilot plan works so we can prove to the people of Enfield this is the way to go at no cost. You're 100% right. And I told you guys, I stand behind you. There's just not a lot of money right now. And this is a perfect example of where I'll stand behind you. Um, then I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move A1 through A14, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Second. Just clarify, this is right. So it's A14, D, E, F, G, and H. Right. A1 through, right. A1 through 14, D, E, F, G, and H to miscellaneous. Yes, right. yeah. And I second it. Motion by Deputy Mayor, Mayor Nelson, seconded by Councilman Mangini. Discussion? Show of hands, all those in favor. Those opposed? Items are moved to miscellaneous. And then I'd just like to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Thank you, Thank Ken. You. Cindy? Thank you, uh, Mayor Cope. And I just wanted an opportunity to... Um, uh, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it. We are in the middle of budget deliberations. There are many items in the budget that I support. Um, adult daycare goes without saying. I know Mayor Copen and I have attended numerous events there proudly, enjoyably. I, I can't speak any higher of the staff and the people that attend. Um, it's a great program. Full day kindergarten. There's no way I would ever consider taking money from Kite or any other program to fund a comparable, equally important educational program. We need to support education. Bottom line, support education. Preschool, ages three, four, five, those are the crucial years. Full day kindergarten, I went to full day kindergarten in 19, I'm not gonna tell you what year. <laughs> um, granted, it was a Catholic school, but you know what? It, it is what it is. And my position is education, you fund it. You don't take it from here, you don't take it from there, you fund it. It's important and it has to be. And I've said my piece, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else before I go? Okay, um, just um, a couple of um, shout outs first. To the, to the first uh, readers group through Kite, uh, first Readers held a ceremony back on Monday, April 22nd, and uh, over 300 uh, First Readers qualified. I, I didn't get the official head count um, on the numbers that uh, came. 160 came. 160 came to Fermi High School, packed the house. Uh, Councilman Stokes, Councilman Mangini, uh, board member Tom Serrard, uh, we were there um, handing out the... Um, Shaking hands, yeah. handing out the, the bookmark Pencils. and a pencil. Yeah. What a great event, and, yes. and hats off to, to all the folks that are involved uh, with First Readers through Kite. Yeah. Uh, then on Friday, the 26th of April, the town of Enfield held uh, our annual Earth Day event here on the green. And Matt, if you can just convey uh, to all staff involved our thanks for, for another uh, great event. Uh, participation uh, by the Child Development Center, uh, the donation of the tree um, that's planted now out on uh, on the town green, and um, it's just a, a great uh, event all around. So uh, thanks to, to staff for their involvement. Uh, the council does have liaisons to the Enfield Athletic Hall of Fame, and they held a very successful fundraiser golf tournament uh, this past Saturday up at Oak Ridge. Um, beautiful day, uh, great round of golf, um, and I believe the organizers were overwhelmed by the support uh, of the community that came out, filled the field, and uh, they just had a, a remarkable day. 
and so congratulations to the Athletic Hall of Fame and uh, continue to keep up the great work that you do. Um, to the folks that um, spoke here this evening, and, and Karen Westlisa and Chris Gomo came up, and uh, Karen uh, texted me. Uh, she had the question on that statistic, and she sent me a text uh, a, about an hour ago. Um, she, her, it states on the pre-K statistics, approximately 65% of Enfield's young children come to kindergarten with a preschool experience. And that does not, uh, the number does not speak to the quality of their experience. It's just that 65% of Enfield's young children come to school with some sort of a preschool experience to kindergarten. So she wanted uh, to clarify that uh, statistic. So Karen, uh, thanks for passing that along. Um, uh, Joanne on Still Lane, thank you for contacting me a couple weeks ago and, and we have a presentation uh, this evening on Roads 2010 and um, what alternatives we have versus the program that we've been following to address issues like um, what you conveyed to me on, on Still Lane. And um, it's, it's not good company be in, but if there's any satisfaction knowing that there are quite a few streets in your condition and we're trying to come up with the right way to address it so that it doesn't uh, continue on for much longer. So appreciate you coming out and or originally contacting me. Uh, to all the folks that spoke about the uh, Enfield Adult uh, Day Center, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for giving us uh, your opinions, your thoughts, your ideas. Um, as Councilman Mangini mentioned, um, I've been there quite a number of times with Cindy. Um, I love the program, and uh, for me, as, as a supporter of it, I, I want to see the town of Enfield um, fund uh, the two positions for this year. And um, what... Uh, Mrs. Moody had said, um, and I think the, the name um, was Hackathon, but create solutions to problems. And in our budget deliberations uh, last week, um, it was specifically mentioned that what we have to do is we have to look at the adult day center and how we attract clients and how we retain clients and what services are provided and really take a long, hard look at the, um, at the program to find a way that it, it returns to its uh, self-sufficiency. Because mm -hmm. over years, um, it's been the one service on the social service side that completely self-funded itself through grants and client fees. So they have a successful track record, and I'm not ready um, to give up on that. And I, I think it may take a time to retool, reconsider, and find a way for, for at least to see and then in the end, then the council makes a decision, could general fund tax dollars be contributed <coughs> on an annual basis to sustain the, the program if we don't feel that it can be self-sufficient for years to come. But we need to do work on our side. And I think you've got the blessing of a large majority of the council to give it at least one more year and really uh, take that time over the course of, of the year to do a hackathon. Um, to understand uh, what we need to do to, to return that program to self-sufficiency. So thanks, and um, I like that comment, a hackathon. So we could do a lot of that in town. Um, uh, to Margaret, just want to, one, one of your comments on, on the Community Center Study Committee. If you actually look in the parentheses on that item on the agenda, um, it was tabled back on January 5th, 2009. So it's, it's a four year in the, in the prog in process. Um, so it's not a recent addition to the agenda. Um, and it's just as important as uh, the adult day center. And I don't, there's not a connection between the two, um, except that it's, I, I believe personally, it's something that the town needs to do on both sides. We need uh, a viable, uh, Enfield Adult Day Center and you have my commitment for that and I also think another screaming need of our community is a community center that uh, that all ages uh, can benefit from 
and we have that potential possibly in the future. Um, but more of that to come uh, down the road. And um, Steve Moriarty, you know, uh, and I, Joey mentioned it, <coughs> on, on the tipper. If we're so concerned that people are going to toss garbage into a trash tipper barrel on yard leaf day or yard waste day, we should be just as concerned that someone's going to put something in a brown tipper. Mm -hmm. And I really got to think the town has to find a way that if it's yard waste day and we've got these containers out uh, that are sitting empty on a pickup day because we can't use it, we're smart enough to figure out a way that it can work. Um, if people are going to contaminate yard waste, they'll contaminate it in a brown tipper barrel. Um, I would just hope that if people use a trash tipper barrel, that they're cleaning it before they're placing uh, yard waste in it. So, I mean, that should be an expectation. And if we find someone, maybe we sticker it with a big red X that's you can't take it off. I don't know. But we should be able to we should be able to find a way to do it to encourage more yard waste collection and we want to get away from mm -hmm. the, bags. the bags so there is a solution there I think a big red violation um, sticker yeah. so people are embarrassed because their neighbors see <laughs> that's they right follow the rules that's right um, and my last comment I think I hit everything I wanted to say and uh, but I would be remiss too not to wish my mom and all you moms up here and at home and in the audience, a happy Mother's Day. Thanks for bringing us in the world, raising us right, and taking good care of us. Well, most so. of us were raised right. Most of us, yes. Anyone else? <laughs> then we'll move to the manager's communications. Matt. Good evening. Uh, we have a series of presentations for you. Uh, we're going to start off with the uh, energy pilot program. Danny Marola is coming up from CCM, and he'll be giving the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, a couple of things. You have before you tonight a memo that's from me, a uh, cover memo, from, which is reflective of the efforts of the uh, energy work team that's been, uh, that was organized over almost a year and a half or two years ago. And this is a reflective of an effort that's been going on for a number of months by the work team to come up with <coughs> excuse me, a pilot project location to do energy enhancements and use that as a learning point for us as we move forward. And the uh, effort has, uh, was initially identified as, a, when we presented to you last year, you'll recall the strategy from the work team the, uh, in that report that you received at that time. The uh, work team consists of members from staff. Uh, Councilman Kensler is a member of the uh, work team, as well as two members from the Clean Energy Committee, uh, Doug Lombardi and Steve Moriarty and they have attended in the past uh, meetings. Uh, the uh, report you have here, once again, is reflect, the cover member reflects uh, in some total the, the game plan to move forward, and really without going into greater detail, I'll turn it over to Mr. Uh, Marola from CCM. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm Andy Marola from CCM, Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. Uh, I manage several of the programs, including the energy program. One of those programs is our energy efficiency program, and uh, that's what uh, I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, I do uh, want to say uh, Jerry Drummond from Siemens was going to be here, but unfortunately he fell ill over the weekend, uh, so he couldn't be here, but uh, he certainly would uh, had intended to do so. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, in terms of um, um, the dollars and cents, um, what we're talking about are dollars that you're spending. Um, you're going to spend the money. Uh, whether you do a project like this or not, um, these are funds that are typically uh, uh, passed and appropriated for energy and operating costs. 
you have to uh, heat your buildings um, and you have to pay for the, uh, the energy that goes into uh, heating, cooling, air conditioning and, and the like. So it really becomes not so much a choice of if, but how. Uh, and unfortunately, um, a, a, in a, a sort of a, a general terms, uh, public buildings um, are not necessarily the most efficient buildings uh, that we have. Um, so I, I just briefly wanted to go over what uh, energy savings performance contracting is. Um, it is a partnership. It's typically a long-term partnership uh, between a company like um, Siemens um, and, uh, in this case, the town of, of Enfield. Um, it involves uh, uh, basically implementing improvements to buildings. They're generically called energy conservation measures, but you can think of them as improvements. Um, Siemens is uh, a couple of things, um, not the least of which is the general contractor. Um, so they don't provide this as a free service. Um, they're paid, they're typically paid during the, what's called the construction phase. Um, and that's out of monies that um, are set aside typically in an escrow account. And just like any other uh, construction project that you have, as that project is completed, um, you're presented with invoices for uh, that percentage of the project that's completed, you pay those until the uh, construction is completed. Um, the difference with a performance contract as opposed to the, the typical construction project is um, on a going forward basis, what is paying for the project are the savings that are generated by the project. Um, basically, if the savings created from the project don't cover the cost of the project, Siemens writes you a check every year. If they promise you $50,000, you save 40, they write you a check for 10 to make you whole each and every year of the program. It's guaranteed. Um, there's a lot of guarantees out there. Um, when our membership, cities and towns, much like Enfield, selected Siemens, one of the most important things that they liked about Siemens was the fact that they are the fourth largest company in the world. So in terms of guaranteeing things, they had real assets to back up the guarantee. Okay typically comes down to, to money, and, and this is the way that a program like this typically works. When we first walk into any school or any town building, typically we see a current budget that is the highest cost and the least efficient. What this program does is we, we begin to install these measures that lower your energy costs. So your energy costs begin to decline um, however long the installation takes, whether it's two, four, six months, 12 months, um, energy costs go down during the period of installation until installation's done. Then really it's when your, your program begins because what we're doing now is we're matching the cost of the program with the savings that the program is generating. And as you can see in the third bullet here, you basically have a reduced energy cost, that's the blue box, and then above that is the green box representing savings. Those savings have to cover the program costs. That's the little white box saying program. And typically there are some additional savings on an on ongoing basis. The other thing you'll notice about the boxes is that they're all the same size. Um, whatever the, the, the budget was, um, it remains the same, except what happens is you've gotten this, in this case, half million dollars investment without spending a dollar more. That's the key. Um, Typically what happens then at the end of the um, financial term, whatever that term is, um, all those savings go to your bottom line. And in addition, um, there's typically some, uh, what I call cost avoidance, that means as the cost of energy goes up, you're still saving the same number of units of energy, but as they become more and more expensive, you're saving more and more dollars. We never include that in our projected savings. That is just additional savings to you. Uh, one example I can give uh, uh, to you is we are now in our sixth phase of this type of project with uh, the borough and schools in Naugatuck. Um, when we completed phase five, we'd looked back in time. Had they not done the project, they would have had to have budgeted an extra $1 million every year simply to take care of the cost, the increased cost of energy over that time period. That's cost avoidance. The project is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, we're talking about um, re replacing a, a boiler at uh, Barnard School. We're completing the lighting project at Barnard School. We're doing uh, weatherization 
uh, and building envelope improvements to save energy. Um, the numbers I think you have, basically this is the net cost after rebates that we were able to get for you from the utility companies. Um, annual savings, those annual savings will offset all of the costs of the program. Um, these are projects that we've done. Um, like I said, we've done six, uh, five program, uh, projects with Naugatuck, we're in the <coughs> sixth. We've done uh, projects with these folks, all on the same basis, paid from savings, uh, different terms, um, depending upon the size of the project and what the improvements were, how much the upfront cost was, et cetera, and what the savings were, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the same, um, the same methodology used throughout. And that's my overview. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Just as a follow-up comment, uh, the reason why the uh, work task force uh, looked at using uh, CCM and Siemens is because CCM did the competitive bidding process for uh, member municipalities and our purchasing procedures allow us to utilize uh, this type of group uh, when a group contract comes out that we can participate in. Also, uh, our town attorney's office has been engaged in this process and has been reviewing to make sure that we have con we are in compliance with the town charter in regards to the amount of money we're spending, uh, not exceeding the amount that would be required for a referendum. And that has also been, uh, we're underneath the threshold that is required for a referendum amount. So those two aspects just to share with the council. And then you have handed out to you a 15-year payment schedule <clears throat> that shows the, uh, in terms of what uh, the cost and the payment per year are. And in this case, you know, what we would not be paying per year because we'd be using our savings towards the principal and interest. And I'll turn it back over to council for any, any question. Council, either Mr. Marola or myself can try to answer. Great. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Dan. Thanks for, for the additional information. Councilman Kensler first, then Councilman Bosco. Thanks, Andy. Um, <clears throat> I know in, in working with the, uh, on, on the work we did, I just want to kind of share with the public on the Energy Task Force. <clears throat> this project has been um, uh, going on, talked about, refined, revisited, revamped, made bigger, made smaller, and all of the above for about eight months nine months and um in conjunction with lynn netty our uh, director of finance who's a hawk on how things are paid for and the logic behind them she's done a really good job at making sure that the town isn't going to spend any more money w doing this project and the goal is um one could argue that you could go out and buy this light bulb for two cents less maybe but the service that's provided by this it eliminates a lot of the work and the roadblocks that the town or any town would normally have to go up against one the vetting has been done and we're we're, we're set with the vendors number two the vendor comes in and does a complete analysis of whatever it is we're trying to do to see what the cost savings would be what the need is and they did that for us in this you don't see a line item for it but it's part of the service where they'll come in and they identified barnard because the question i had was what one school would be your number one target i don't want to go into a school and revamp if it was half revamped three years ago Let's find the one with the greatest need and turn it into our first energy showcase. So with that, we came up with Barnard. Um, the one sticking point we did have was the boiler, uh, because a boiler is a very expensive item, and you can't show a lot of savings going from a fairly efficient boiler to a very efficient boiler. It's not a lot of dollars of fuel savings. Uh, if this boiler was 60 years old, it would be a totally different story. But the boiler we have needed to be replaced soon anyway, and better to go out and include it in a performance contract than to have to go out in an emergency in February and, and spend three four $400,000 non-negotiated on an emergency repair, replacement. Um, so I, I just want to assure the public that the task force directed by the assistant town manager and through CCM and all the participants have done, I think, a fabulous job. And the goal is, my goal, is to, is to have an energy project every year that we can do that doesn't add to the taxpayer's um, enormous crunch that they have already and ends up saving us a lot of money down the road and provides a clean energy footprint for our town. And hopefully in six or seven years, we don't just have one or two 
um, of these projects to talk about, uh, the majority of our town will actually be running under them, and we won't have had to write a check per se for any of them. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Joey, then Tom. Well, I'm all for this project, but the uh, only reservations I have is our Clean Energy Committee didn't give it a blessing, and I would have felt much better if they did give it the blessing. The only problems I find with these projects are is just because CCM bid it doesn't mean that it's the best bid. I can tell you, for example, I can see a lot of state bid stuff that it's more than you can get at retail on the street for. So, you know, I, I would feel more comfortable doing this and uh, having us get someone else to bid it. Because no matter what, they're saying we're going to save it with, sa with, with we're going to pay for it with savings, but savings is still money. So if we can get this job done for 10% less, our savings are going to be even greater. And to, to just go off of what CCM uh, says is the best deal there is out there. Uh, just because they vetted it doesn't mean that it's true. And I really would love to see another quote on this and uh, then figure out what's going on. Actually, uh, it was competitively bid, and the lowest qualified bid was awarded the project. Well, it may have been competitively bid, but bids do change. Uh, I, I can tell you, for example, I know bids that that are out there that was competitively bid, and there's still more money. You know, we, we, we may find someone that'll do it cheaper. And and you know what? If we're going to get a loan on this, it's our money. So what's the difference if we pay for it or we have Siemens somewhat do this paperwork or CCM does uh, the lease for us? We get the lease in our own name. If we can save 10% or 5%, on the whole project, we're still going to do better. If, if it's okay to respond. Um, sure, please do. Basically, we did competitive bidding for the specific uh, program here with lighting companies and uh, boiler companies. Um, Siemens acts as the general contractor, um, so they put it out to bid. Bids were received and reviewed with the town staff, and the award was made to the most qualified bidder at the, at the lowest cost. Um, this wasn't, um, again, a CCM bid. The CCM bid was to, uh, to get a partner for our energy efficiency program, and that was Siemens. When we do these individual projects for individual towns, competitive bidding is, is done and reviewed with town staff. Just like the financing typically is competitively bid, um, there's no interest on, in either CCM or Siemens part in terms of where the financing comes from. The lowest cost of money is, is always the best. Um, so that, that's sort of the modus operandi of all of these projects to get the, um, the, the most efficient equipment at the lowest possible cost. So then Siemens is just a general contractor in this deal? Actually, Siemens does a few things. If you think about a construction um, uh, project, uh, if you're building a, a, a building, you need an architect to do the design, then a construction manager to handle, handle that. Siemens basically bundled all, all this together. As a matter of fact, something that they did um, at no cost to the town uh, was something called an investment grade audit. They didn't charge and field anything for that process. That basically involves going in, seeing what your equipment is, what equipment should be replaced, um, how best to use the existing equipment, and then doing the design spec so that you can do a bid. Um, that process typically in, in, involves cost. They didn't charge anything to, to Enfield to do that. It was simply thrown into the cost of the project. So if we find a general contractor that's worth working in a smaller margin, we're going to save some money. I, I'm, I'm all set with it. Thanks, Joey. Tom. Yeah, yeah, Dan, you mentioned the, the referendum, too. Isn't this the same project that we brought to the voters uh, several years ago, just on a smaller scale, or not at all? It's Can very you, similar. Same. On a, on a much smaller because scale. Because right? if I, you know, memory serves me right, it was really the largest bid process in the state of Connecticut. When you go out to bid, it goes to the largest amount of possible bidders uh, that you could possibly get together, which makes, and, and if I believe that was one of the selling points back then and, and is today, you, you have a large pool of, of uh, bidders. Um, it, the, the bidding is really un, uh, unrestricted. We just have uh, um, Siemens, again, 
selected by our membership. Um, no CCM staff participates in any selection for any of our programs. It's all done by, depending upon the program, in this case it was public works directors, town managers. They selected Siemens to be the partner for CCM. Our job was to iron out um, a standard performance contracting agreement. Uh, which we did with help from outside counsel. That's the agreement that we use. I can tell you it's a great agreement. I can tell you Siemens doesn't use it for any other projects but ours. Um, but then on a going forward basis, um, yeah, everything is done in, in, in that way. Siemens does act as a uh, general contractor. They certainly have uh, tons of experience in doing this. They've done 325 projects in the last <coughs> five years alone. So they do have networks of, of uh, other companies that they work with, but um, it is always competitively bid. Um, what you won't get is someone who's coming in with a low ball price who can't deliver. Um, you, you are going to get a vetting process through companies that have done similar work in many other projects. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Cindy, you're next. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment here. I um, want to applaud your efforts and hard work. I been on the board of CCM for a few years now, and Tom also for your diligence in uh, briefing the council periodically as you have been on the process and the progress. So again, I certainly support the efforts and I find no issues um, with uh, what you're presenting and I, I think we should uh, go forward. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Any further comments? Um, just thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess I just take exception, and, and maybe the clarification happened after in the discussion. But uh, you know, we we established this energy task force, and the Clean Energy Committee has two people on it, and you know they're part of the process, and um, they've had opportunities to to give their opinions and you know, and attend meetings, and we as a town can't stop because one body or some people may raise a red flag. They have the opportunity, they had a seat at the table, they have two seats at the table, and if they don't choose to take advantage of it, that doesn't mean we stop moving forward. It was a huge mistake that this community voted this referendum down a couple years ago. I mean, so short-sighted. Um, unbelievable and the amount of money that this town would have saved years ago and we would have been benefiting today and maybe it would be a little less tough of a budget year this year last year the year before and years before that but it didn't happen and we set the town out to say look the voters said no to a very large encompassing project but go back to the drawing board identify small projects or smaller uh, a smaller effort and and prove to the council prove to the community that that um, these contracts are worthwhile and something that we need to take advantage of to drive our energy costs down and that's exactly what we ask staff and the task force to do um, I'm ready to move forward I thank you for doing the due diligence the work have confidence in CCM and their um, and the bid process that they put out, CCM represents us statewide. Um, we have to have confidence in, in groups like that. Um, so I'm sorry, maybe you changed your mind, Joey, but it's time to move forward on efforts like this, or we're just going to. I'm not against it. I just would like, you know, this is the first I heard about it, and I would have liked a little bit more information before. I really jumped into it because when he was talking, the first thing I didn't really really understand was that they did send this school out for a competitive bid. But I still would always, on a project something this big, I would like to see another number. Uh, the, the idea is wonderful. I, I mean, we did it at our garage. But it's just, it's a big number just to go with one company. And that's that's my only, my only issue with I it. I think, because it... Please clarify how you selected Siemens for the project, but for Siemens is your contractor for energy performance contracting for CCM. So it's not this project specific. It's the competitive process was to identify the company that CCM endorsed and all the lists that you had on your on your presentation. 
the Siemens is performing that that work. Correct. So don't I don't want you to think, Joey, that it was this school was bid. It's Siemens as the energy performance contracting group. Actually, the, the, the work for this project was also bid, and we shared the bids with town staff. Okay. So um, they, you know, basically it, it, the CCM process was to get a partner to do this. Obviously, most of these projects are long-term commitments, so uh, we have a long-term uh, agreement with Siemens. But in terms of this specific project, there was competitive bidding. Okay. Um, we shared the competitive bid results with town staff, reviewed them. This is your project. It's, it's really not CCM's project. It's your project. And with town, we created basically what you see before you as, as the project. With town, we, we helped with the financing to put together the lowest possible financing to do the most work for the least amount of money. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Dan. Mr. Ne Mayor, just... And next steps, if you can hit that. That's what I was going to hit on, was <coughs> if, the count, if, the, if we have consensus from the council based on the briefing, what we'd like to do is prepare for the next meeting. The town attorneys also prepare a resolution that would authorize the town manager to enter into the appropriate agreement so we can move forward, because the goal would be to start work on July 1st. Consensus? Yes. Nodding heads? Go ahead, Joey. So we benchmarked a, a, a high number that we're going to pay. And if we, for, we well, you get, he said, excuse me, Siemens will guarantee us the difference that we didn't save. So that mark is benchmarked already um, at so much a kilowatt hour or however they do it. So, you know, they're, they're not going to say, well, you, you turn the heater on. Uh, a week earlier, and that's why it's more money this time. They got a number there that that's capped. Is that correct? Well, it, um, uh, the the, the so-called what ifs. What if it gets uh, what if it gets warmer or colder in any given year? Those are all covered by the performance contracting agreement with Siemens that was vetted by CCM and outside counsel. So all of those kind of scenarios are, are handled in the contract. But yeah, there has to be a baseline. So there was benchmarking done in terms of how the building is used today, what the energy costs are today. But the guarantee is not in dollars, it's in units of energy. And that's very important because as the cost of a unit of energy goes up, if you told Siemens, well, the guarantee is $32,000, and the cost of those units goes up, their guarantee, the value of the guarantee goes down because they'll be guaranteeing fewer units of energy. You want to put them on the hook for units of energy so that regardless of the price of those units of energy, they're on the hook to produce that amount of savings, and that's where the guarantee is. And my reference to, uh, to Naugatuck was precisely along those lines. The value of those units of energy went up tremendously over time. That's why they would have had to have budgeted an extra million dollars just to be where they were before we started. Anyone else? We have consensus. <coughs> so next meeting to start July 1. Thank you, Dan. Thank Thanks you very everyone. much. I think uh, next we'll have the presentation on the roads program, please. Roads 2010. Is Before you have, of course, uh, the Director of Public Works, Jonathan Bilms. We have the Deputy Director of Public Works, Bill Taylor, and our Assistant Town Engineer, John Kibibo. And uh, as a preface, uh, this is something that they started working on probably even before they met with me to start working on this. But uh, in January, they were instructed to put together uh, recommendations on how to utilize the remaining funds that are not committed yet as part of Roads 2010. And, uh, you know, we are confronted with uh, basically about $9 million left uncommitted in the Roads 2010 uh, project. And so with that, I'm turning it over to... 
Jonathan, to lead off. Oh, he's down to touch microphone. Sorry. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of the Town Council. Uh, Matt has introduced John Kabibbo and Billy Taylor, and what we're going to do today is uh, give you a recommendation on the Roads 2010 funding. And uh, as a program, We can't see what, what was on oh, the television. It's right there at the microphone. Don't know what to push to get it. Paging Bill Lee. Paging Bill Lee. <laughs> Input? Input. He heard you. <laughs> yes. Oh, there it is. It's, it's up. It's up. It's up. Okay. They must have done the other room. Good job, Greg. We'll go down to the next one. I just touched it. Cancel page, Bill. Okay, so we're going to make our recommendation on the Roads 2010 funding, as uh, Town Manager Matt Coppler said. And uh, it's important that um, we give some background because as the program has matured, also some of the thinking is changing and evolving. And so we're going to be spending a few minutes giving you background on what's been done to date and also some concepts on pavement management. And the reason we're doing that is to give you all foundation so you can understand our recommendation, which is going to be different than uh, maybe you've heard in the past and the way the program has been uh, put forward. So without further ado, I know it's already getting late, and but we do have a presentation. And I said, as I said, we're going to start with background, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bill Taylor. Thank you, and good evening. Um, the uh, first slide uh, shows that shows the roads that have been reconstructed or under construction or under design as a result of the three roads programs beginning with Roads 2000. This, this represents a total of 48.8 miles as compared to the total road system which is 181 miles. This slide uh, combines the, re the reconstruction streets that we showed in the previous slide, now shown in black, and the 14 and a half miles of street that were overlaid, that got an asphalt overlay, under the roads 2000 and 2005 programs. They're shown in green. Combined, this is a total of 63.3 miles, or 35% of the town road network. The next slide indicates the dollars that were authorized under the three um, roads programs to date and also the miles improved. In parenthesis, the, the, the numbers in parenthesis show the miles of road reconstructed and the roads overlaid in that order. So for example, roads 2000, 24.1 miles of road were reconstructed and 13 and a half miles of road got asphalt overlays. At this point, 9.1 million, as Tom Andrew mentioned, 9.1 million dollars remains to be sent, to be spent. As you can see from this and the previous two slides, the bulk of this money has been spent on reconstruction. There are a variety of other treatments that that we can use and the questions going forward are how do we go forward and what is the appropriate mix of reconstruction and other treatments such as pavement restoration. Just a few words about the pavement management approach. I think it can be summed up in that first line that says what we're trying to do is apply the right treatment on the right road at the right time. And therefore, we're trying to extend the lives of roads that are in good or, or fair condition. The traditional practice of repairing the worst roads first is the most expensive way to operate the system. So finally, what we're trying to do is get the biggest bang for the buck. Just quickly to give you an idea, we're going to talk about something called pavement condition index. It's simply a measure of the condition of the pavement. It varies between zero being the poorest 
and 100 being the best. This is a picture of a road, it happens to be Windsor Street, with a, pay, with a PCI of 100. <coughs> Going down the scale, this is a road uh, with a PCI 69, it's Middlesex Drive, and you can see it's got extensive cracking, um, but at this point really doesn't require uh, reconstruction. And then finally, this is Sky Street, and you can see the over to the right, those, maybe it's a little hard to see, but those are holes right, right through the pavement, and the aggregate from the pavement spread across the pavement on the left side there. This kind of road needs a re, uh, base rehabilitation. You need to dig it out and um, replace or augment the base before it can be repaved. Otherwise, we're just wasting money on it. This slide uh, shows a curve, and, and the curve shows the rate. I'll use the pointer just briefly here. It shows the rate at which uh, a pavement condition deteriorates over time. It starts up here when it's excellent and slowly, slowly degrades for the first part of its life. When it reaches about midlife, it starts to degrade much quicker. When we get down into this almost vertical part of the, the graph, um, at this point it needs total reconstruction. Uh, the point, a couple points of this slide are that uh, if when the pavements are, point, are approaching that so-called midlife age, we could intervene with some rather inexpensive treatments at this point, get the, get the uh, condition back up to excellent, and then a few years later intervene again and again and again and keep this road in decent condition while spending a minimal amount of money. Um, what we've been doing, for the most part, is waiting till we get here. We're not waiting, but we've had roads that were in. We, we can't see you're here, so okay. you have sorry. to do a little more explanation. Turn, turn the mic. OK. I'm sorry. I thought that was. Uh, That's not interactive. I can. It's good so, for the audience. But okay, so can you see that now? This yep. general yep. curve is how the road uh, degrades over time. As it as it approaches midlife, we want to intercept it at this point here, do an inexpensive uh, preservation treatment to get it back up to an excellent condition. And I lost my cursor again. Then as it degrades slightly over time again, intervene again at this point to get it up to excellent, and so on. What we've done, uh, what we've been doing in the past is spending most of our money down here at this point on the curve when it costs many more times to, to uh, uh, get a pavement back up into excellent condition. <coughs> the arrow keeps going away on me, I'm sorry. At any rate. <coughs> So basically the point is we need to be spending more money up at that top point uh, in order to keep pavements in good condition. Um, we have a, a computerized pavement management program and um, in 1998, 2003, and 2010, there all the roads in town were surveyed and given a rating. Uh, which we've referred to as PCI, Pavement Condition Index. And you can see how the average pavement condition has varied over time. Uh, starting in 1998, it was 74, and then it increased slightly, uh, going in the right direction in 2003, but when it was resurveyed in 2010, you see the condi overall condition of the roads actually um, decreasing. We think this is reflective of a one-sided and less than optimal, optimal mix of treatments and illustrates why we rec we're going to be recommending a change in strategy. It's clear that a change uh, will improve the overall number. Um, one question you might be asking yourselves is, well, what should that number be? And there's no, there's no perfect 
or, or one size fits all answer to that question. It certainly it would vary depending on what where your condition starts out, and certainly how much uh, resources you have to to put into improvement. But we think a reasonable goal would be um, in the lower to mid 80s to try to get the overall condition to. So um, up till now, roads 2010, um, we've we've done 10.8 miles of total reconstruction. That's 10.8 miles that either been built or under construction or out to bid. Uh, we haven't done any of the pavement preservation work that I briefly touched on, and we have 9.1 million dollars to spend. So we come to the recommendations. Um, first slide indicates, uh, entails what we call so-called soft costs. Specifically, that's money for design and inspection of the uh, projects that we're, you're going to see in a couple of slides. It's also design work for the first part of a roads 2015 program. Um, it includes a roads engineer to manage the program. We feel very strongly that a project this size needs someone dedicated to it to oversee it. Uh, it's, a, it's a major investment for the town and it's really a full-time job in order to oversee the, oversee the program. Uh, finally, we have money in there to resurve, resurvey the pavement condition in a year or so. Um, obviously, we need to know what's going on. If we don't measure what's going on, we can't manage the program properly. And it should be noted that the overall soft costs are less than 15% of the remaining funds. This slide uh, just shows the principal duties of the engineer that we're recommending. Uh, I won't read them all, but uh, obviously has overall management, would have overall management of the $10 million program. He, he or she would improve communications with the public, use the pavement management software, which we own, to help get the average PCI up into the 80s, more closely coordinate with the utilities, and also one of our goals is to update the council regularly on the roads program and this engineer would be responsible for doing that. Now we come to the recommendations for uh, the hard costs on the, un the uncommitted funding. First recommendation is to do some routine maintenance and pavement preservation. I define that at this point as a thin overlay of one inch of asphalt, which is which follows uh, crack sealing and patching where required. Second uh, part of the program that we're recommending is to mill and place a two inch overlay on 17 streets. I should I should go back. The first that first program, the one inch overlay would would touch 30 streets and uh, rehabilitate 22 miles of pavement. The second one, the structural improvement, the thicker overlay, which is a <coughs> mill and overlay in most cases, uh, would improve 17 streets and 5.2 miles of pavement. And then finally, we have a reserve in there for Mullen Road. We've been, <laughs> we've been racking our brains in in-house trying to figure out what to do with Mullen Road short of a total reconstruction that would be a multi-million dollar project. And uh, in response to that, we're currently seeking an opinion from one of our uh, roads engineers who we've contacted so we can uh, help us figure out what to do with Mullen Road. So this, this uh, final slide that I have 
uh, before turning back over to Jonathan, it just shows the recommended program, uh, the 47 streets, 27.2 miles of road. Uh, the streets that are shown in green would be the streets that get the thin overlay. The streets that are in red, and I think there's a little blue in there, uh, would get the two inch overlay. One thing I would like to point out about this is that many of those roads that we we'd be preserving so we can avoid reconstruction are heavily traveled roads in town. <coughs> so just to summarize, 35% uh, of the town roads have been improved under the roads program so far and our recommendation is to improve over 15% of the town roads alone in just the next two years by shifting the focus from reconstruction to more pavement management and preservation techniques as Billy just described. Um, and that concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Um, I have Carol, Tom, Bill. Yeah, I guess go right down the line. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation, gentlemen. Um, a couple quick questions. Um, obviously, we'd all like a copy of the roads that you have um, recommended doing. So if you could get those to Matt and so we could all have them for folks that call us all the time on the roads. Um, my question, and I don't know if you can answer this without doing a little research. Um, originally, when we put the first Roads 2000 out, um, there were roads on the list to be done uh, that obviously didn't get done in the Roads 2000 project. And then we put the Roads 2005 out, and there were roads that didn't get done in that as well. My question is, you know, we keep selling these referendums with these roads on them and people plan on their roads being done. And I know we can only do so much with the money we have. I understand the logistics of the money. My question is, how many roads that were originally on our Roads 2000 list either haven't been touched yet, if any, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking legitimately wondering, and the same for two road, uh, Roads 2005. Um, to the, the lady that spoke from Still, um, Still Road, um, I know my road was on Roads 2000. It never got done. And it was on Roads 2005. It got done at the end of that project. So I waited over 10 years for my road to be done. So my question is, how many other people are waiting to have their roads done that voted for the first referendum and then voted for the second referendum and then you, you know where I'm going with this. So I guess um, there's, there's a ton of roads. I drive a ton of roads every day and I know there's some really, really bad roads. So I'm really anxious to see that list. Um, but I'd be very interested to find out how far back you've gone to see what roads haven't been touched from that first and second referendum. Okay. That's that's one of my questions. I want to put that list and together. You want that submitted to you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I yeah. imagine. I don't know. Can you answer if you looked at that? Did anybody actually go back and check the first roads 2000, 2005, and then 10? We didn't look at the roads that we missed, but we we know that there are. In fact, that's a lot of the decision making on, on how we proceed. In fact, I know. For Road 2000, the first program, um, as you can imagine, there were streets all over town. Yep. And we had, I don't have the street number, we had 22 sections of town circled as project areas. And we only got 14 of those sections done. And um, one of the sections that already was designed in 2000 was pushed to 2005 so that that project was already designed so it was the first one to be constructed after they you know after the the voters voted for the next referendum in 2005 and we continued a lot obviously this a lot of the same streets are were still 
in that. I, I'd like to run upstairs. I have the crusty old map that has the 22 sections on it, but it doesn't have the street specific. So we didn't look at street specific, but area wise. And I, I think that that's something that you know, we can put together. Yeah. And, and you can see what, you know, how it's progressed where, okay, we, we didn't get to these, but we did get to them in, in 05 and, and the same thing, the crossover from 2005 to two, 2010. Um, obviously, there were streets that didn't get that done. Didn't get I, done. I, I know that. But we are still, you know, we're still working on, on those streets. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the bidding process and whatnot. We, we don't know exactly what, you know, cost fluctuations and whatnot. So, but we will put that list together for you. But my, my concern is there's a trust level with the voter at this point that if you were on roads 2000 and then 2005 and you're, you keep voting that referendum through, we're, we're going to be not getting referendums through if people aren't seeing their roads that were on the list originally to be slated to be done at that point and then not done. So I'm, I'm just curious how many we're not getting to that were on those first and second lists to be done. So that's Thanks, Carol. Tom? Thanks, guys. <clears throat> and I know you're spending a lot of sweat e equity trying to get this figured out. And, and because over the years, the overlap of, you know, 2000 goes now into 2005 with some roads and 2010. And when we get to the next one, you know, it's always playing catch up. Where I see a big opportunity, and I like the, 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 um, the ceiling project, I think, has saved a lot of roads that you've gone around and done, um, you know, for the cracks because those turn into destroyed roads re really shortly like your sh your chart list showed um where i see we need to uh address really immediately is if you have somebody that has a road that you know you have to reconstruct it it's got big potholes in it and it's gone through down into the into the base i don't think we spend enough time and energy patching that, you know, the two-year patch, the three-year patch, the one-year patch, to keep that road from completely, you know, falling apart. Um, I go to other towns all the time in my travels, and I see a lot of towns that have these, they do their patches in nice squares. They cost a little bit more to do, um, but they go in there and they actually hit it with a steamroller or a mini steamroller, and it gives them a, you know, maybe a year in that area. Um, <laughs> Diesel. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but but I think there's a lot of roads in Enfield that because of the problem you're in, if we spent a little bit of money, we could patch some of these roads, like the one you showed in the picture there. Nobody wants to drive down that street on their way home every night and lose their front end in, on their street. If you have those kinds of problems, and I know Mullen Road is like falling into the swamp, totally different animal. You can't just go patch that. That needs a lot of work. But there are a lot of little streets in our town that the neighbors, the people like Carol mentioned with the trust factors, you know, would at least see us doing something inexpensive, temporary that actually got them through that next year. And it might buy you some time on some of these roads that you know you're going to have to do anyway, but why let it sit for three more years? It's too late to, to, to put the, um, the um, ceiling in it. And you're not going to get to it for two more years. Let's let's give the residents some real patching, not where they just come out at the end of a truck and throw the stuff on the hole and pat it with the shovel and leave. And then the next nine cars that drive by turns it into a pothole again, like Simon Road and those roads. Um, really, really patch it. That, that's my my suggestion. And I know you got a lot to do, and but I think that in the end will buy you more time to fix the real problems. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Bill? I guess my question is, in terms of, I guess we'll see the data that about the roads and the new ratings, and um, I'll be curious to get that. But um, when we look at a, an area that, that we have for several years now, like Buckhorn, is there a specific strategy for, for the Buckhorn development? I think we all kind of recognize it's going to be perhaps one of the most costly um, sections that we've undertaken so far. How is Buckhorn being addressed? And you can tell us tonight or, or we can wait for the memo. Um, but that one I know we've all understood to be, you know, one of the more serious needs and we haven't seen much movement in Buckhorn yet. 
That's it. You'll submit it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Tom? Yeah, the old philosophy, who put this together the first time, how, how, how did that happen? The people that judged the or, or rated and graded the roads the first time compared to what you're doing now, what's the difference in philosophies? Well, I, I think the, the rating, the same company has done the ratings, right? So that, yes. that's been consistent, the same company doing that for all three uh, road projects. What, what is being suggested here, the change is instead of focusing 100 or 90 percent of the money on reconstruction of roads, is to start splitting that out going forward, saying, okay, we need to spend some money on the reconstruction, we need to spend some money on the, the pavement management side. And, you know, what, what they didn't talk about, which is, you know, what, what could be done with $9 million of road reconstruction? We, we did, yes, we, we ran that number. So um, our recommendation, if, if you use the $9 million for the pavement preservation roads, we mentioned 47 streets and 27 miles. If you did road reconstruction, you'd only be able to do 5.7 miles. So if you put all that money into road reconstruction, because it's so, more, so much more expensive, as we said, you would touch 5.7 miles, whereas we're recommending 27 miles. But, but they're different streets and they have different needs, but you can just the cost of reconstruction is that much more than what we're recommending. So that's just to put out there. But now the needs were the worst roads went first, right? So now are you, are you going to balance out some of those are going first and some of the re, just the reconstruction are going secondary, you know, uh, roads that aren't is that, that you're trying to prevent from getting to where they are today. And that, that, I think, so you know, one, of, one of the, the more um, eye-opening slides that, that I saw was that PCI over the last 10 years. And you saw that average, you know, after 2003, or at 2003, getting ready for roads 2005, jumped up from, I think it was 72 to 79 or 74 to 79, I can't remember what it was. And then you saw in 2010, when we were getting ready for roads 2010, that started falling back down to 72 or 74 or wherever it was. So we're going back down. What I think they're trying to tell us in this is that, that when you look at, at what was done in the early years, so from 2000, 2003, the worst roads were taken care of in reconstruction. And so, you know, a lot of the other roads were still in a higher PCI where those other, you know, the lower roads since there was a lot done, moved up. Mm -hmm. And so there was an increase. But over the last seven years, what we're seeing is that those roads that were at a higher level are now starting to dip down into the, the 60s and 50s that are starting to drag that overall PCI down. So play that out over the next 10 years. And then you're going to keep we're, falling we're going further to, and further yeah, behind. Effectively, we're going to even get further behind than what we are today because those roads that were, you know, 10 years ago at, at an 80 or even upper 70s, today is probably getting into the 50s. And again, 10 years down the road, you know, we're going to be even further behind. So what the change in the strategy is to say, okay, we got to keep those roads that we are spending a lot of money on reconstructing today. In good shape. As high as a level. And, and that's, again, that, that curve that they showed. You know, the strategy that we're talking about is trying to keep everything that we can at extremely high level. So you so may be, you may be already spend as much. going back to something you reconstructed and start crack sealing it. Which is Correct. a huge yeah. issue, and I hear it from a lot of people that have, a, you know, in a lot of streets that, why aren't they sealing my, our cracks? Because once water gets in there in the winter and it freezes, that's where you get a pothole. And I think it's a super great yeah. idea to and, start that again. And the, the strategy, the, the true strategy is not a two-year strategy, a one-year strategy, a two-year strategy, or even a 10-year strategy. We're talking about a strategy that, that goes into the life cycle of the road itself. Um, you know, there's debate. You could, we could all debate this. You know, a life cycle of a road can be anywhere from 25 to 35 years. You know, the strategy that we're proposing is to try to extend that life of a road so we don't have to, every 30 years, reconstruct the road. And the, the challenge we have today is we have a lot of roads 
that are well beyond that 35 years that need re reconstructed today. And we're not going to be committing all the resources to take care of all those roads. We're going to have to split it. Part of it goes to the, you know, the reconstruction. Part of it has to go to you know, maintaining the roads that are in good shape, keeping them at a high level so they don't turn into the next road that has to be you know, rebuilt before the 35 year. Or, or again, if we do it right, we may never have to rebuild the roads that we rebuild as part of the roads program. That's, that's the change in the strategy, is, is moving away from just solely, or at least the majority of the money being spent on reconstruction, starting to split that into reconstruction as well as the- Maintenance, uh, maintenance. of the roads to make sure they get a little few more years out of them. Right, and, and you know, we're, we're spending, you know, approximately from the roads program, anywhere from five to eight million, nine million dollars a year. In, in road reconstruction and a little bit on the pavement management. I'm telling you right now that, that you know, I, in, and this isn't like coming from rocket science or anything, you know, we're not spending enough money yearly on the roads. Um, we're falling further behind. And, and you know, I think where, where we have to get to at some point is if the roads program is going to be based upon reconstruction, that means we're gonna have to be putting out money on a yearly basis for pavement management. And, and that's, you know, the challenge we have. Until that commitment is made as well, we're going to be, you know, falling further and further behind. So the strategy we're trying to put out there now is to try to balance that, you know, put some money, and, and already most of the, the money that's been spent as part of Roads 2010 has been on reconstruction, and, and those roads need it. Now we're gonna start spending the money on the pavement management side of it as well, the maintenance, um, to try to keep those roads that could be lost in the next five to 10 years from being lost. Yeah. In, a, in the long term, it's good for the town. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It might hurt a little bit yeah. because my road, I think, just fell off the list on this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be waiting well, again. But I understand the philosophy, and I think it's important that we don't leave all this money we poured into these roads to begin with, um, you know, to go to uh, potholes. Great. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, you Tom. Can I just comment, Mayor, just quickly that uh, in the Roads 2000 program, which was the first one, there was a much better mix or more even mix of reconstruction and rehabilitation. And then the, the 2005, that didn't happen. And in 2010, so far, that hasn't happened. But if you, if you know, if our recommendation moves forward at the end of the 2010 program, that mix of reconstruction and and preservation will be similar to what took place in 2000, the first time the <coughs> referendum was authorized. Which is one of the designers of the program back in 2000. That was the intention of the program in 05 and 010 as well. It may not have happened that way, but that was always the intent. Joey. Well, at least we're getting some answers. Not ones I like to hear. Um, you know, I, I've been, from day one on the council, complaining and complaining and complaining about just what Tom said to the point that it doesn't work to complain no more. I don't know why, during the winter, when we put the coal patch in these, these potholes, we don't mark them, paint them, do something so we remember to go back, cut them out, and fix them correctly. You know, just a little quick mill and and, uh, uh, and and sealing it and putting some blacktop is going to really extend the life of our uh, roads. Right now, uh, we're going back so far in, in my district. You take Rocket Run and some of the other ones there, the roads are turning into dirt. And, um, you know, I understand going back and fixing the roads, and I agree with it, but we got to do something with these dirt roads. Uh, you know, we, we got to, you know, I see some roads that are getting reconstructed that, yes, I know they need to be done, but when you're, when you're having chunks of a blacktop and, and gravel popping up from the road, I mean, even if we take some monies and just do some temporary stuff so the big chunks of blacktop don't fall out and and go all into the people's yards. I mean, we got to do something. I mean, still lane. You, you, you got to do something there. 
even if it's not going to be a permanent fix, you know, we can't be having the roads uh, turning into dirt and, you know, buckhorn. I mean, it, you, you have potholes down there that you could lose a truck in. Uh, we, you know, we got to do something with these roads, some kind of relief for the people that run them. Uh, we can't just ignore them. And, and some of that money that you're going to spend has to be spent to at least make these roads passable because we're, we're going to start getting uh, liability claims coming in because, you know, you, 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 they're just horrible and turning into gravel again. So, you know, we need to look at the real bad roads, too. And I understand them roads are bad. And they're probably not going to get much worse than they are, but we still need to make them travelable. I mean, never mind a kid riding his bicycle on them falling down. So something's got to be looked at on these roads that are turning back to dirt. Thank you, Joey. Ken? So you want to take $9 million from the current roads 2010 and move it over to road? No. No, this, this, this is part of the roads 2010. You might recall that there was a little bit change in the language that, you know, as the referendum allows for the, the maintenance of the roads, and, and that's the crack ceiling and the, the inch overlays and such like that. So it's not taking any money from the roads. In, instead of committing that $9 million for total reconstruction of the 5.2 or 5.2 mile, it would be used for the 22.7 or whatever that number was, 27, 27, 27. mile rather than that. <clears throat> so that's, that would be the change. So whose roads were scheduled to be reconstructed aren't going to get reconstructed now? And that's what the voters voted on. That's the same, Mine, that's the same question <laughs> Councillor Hall asked. So we're, we're in response to that, we're going to provide a list. But, but the list doesn't work. I mean, the people voted on that, well, and they I passed understand. it. Well, but, but on the list, there were, there were actually two different types of treatments that were talked about there was the full depth reconstruction and then there was what they're talking about tonight which is the i'm referring probably improperly is the pavement management approach pavement but preservation pavement yeah. preservation so you know what what we're doing is saying what's the best way to spend the remaining money and we can get 5.2 million or 5 5.2 no, miles of road reconstruction total full depth reconstruction or the 27 miles of of the pavement maintenance or management. So both were part of the program. So Still Lane could be a road that doesn't get done. Rocket Run could be a road that doesn't get done. When you pave over a road with a crack on it, it's got a crack in it a year later. It does. I, I mean, we can't, you can't pave over something that's not good to begin with. I mean, yeah, we could make it all look good for a year. But then when they plow, they're plow plowing up slabs of blacktop because they didn't stick below it. We've seen it before. They don't sweep the roads right. And we're concerned about maintaining the roads that just got done from 2000 till now with cracks and stuff like that. I, I mean, is the quality of work there? I, we shouldn't be worrying about a road that was paved in 2000. I mean, I see the roads project an ongoing thing. I agree with you. Every five years, there's going to be a referendum, and we have to spend millions. Eventually, we're going to get to all the roads in town. And then, hopefully, it slows down where we can put money aside. But right now, we still have so many roads in this town that are, Joe, they're, right, they're dirt roads. I mean, uh, Buckhorn, right, all of these streets still, these people voted knowing their road was going to get done. We can't finish the roads that we already scheduled. 2000 got pushed to 2005. And I hope the roads in 2000 that didn't get done were prioritized in 2005 and so on and so forth. So I understand that roads in 2010 got pushed back, but they will get done. If not in this referendum, they'll be first and next referendum because that's what the people, they wouldn't have voted on them if they had a different list of roads out there. So I, just to change midway and say, okay, well, yeah, we had your road up there, but, you know, we said we could do this, too. I, I can't go with that. You know, I agree. We need to put money aside for fixing roads. How come we don't do chip and seal on our roads? I mean, all the other towns do it, and their roads are sticking together, and they're old farm roads. 
we're, we're asking the same questions, Councillor. You know, we got here, there was a program in place. If you take that 2010 report, it basically covers crack seal, thin overlay, thicker overlay, like two or three inch, and, re, and base rehabilitation, which is reconstruction. <coughs> but there are other treatments out there that, that we're quite aware of and that we're, you know, I'm familiar with personally that can be used. And as we go forward, uh, we'd like to diversify and use some of those programs. We've already, uh, with the consultants that we have now working on the design of the projects that one is out to bid and two more will be la later this year, we've already told them um, we know these roads are slated for reconstruction, but we want you to look at what's out there. If there's material out there that can be reused and save the town money, we want it reused. We don't want it all just dug up and hauled off to some other location. Um, so we're, we're, tr we're, we're trying to incorporate treatments that will save the town money over time. But to your main point, I, I understand, you know, people felt they were promised, and, and they were effectively promised in the previous programs. I understand that and, and respect that. But the fact is, the, 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 cart, the, har, the, the car is falling off the cliff. Uh -huh. And if we keep pouring all our money into fixing the worst roads first, the overall condition of the roads is just going to keep getting worse and worse. Unless we had an unlimited amount of money. Bill, I, I agree with you. And the consultant said you need $45 million to get the roads back up into a decent condition. I agree with you guys all the way. And I'm not arguing that. What I'm stating is we gave the people a promise to get this money. I agree. And we're not keeping our promise. I can't support that. Point so roads 2015, let's restructure it. Let's make it very clear. Instead of doing 30 roads, we're only doing 15. And the rest of the money is going to save a road that's not so bad so it doesn't fall apart but we can't push off you know the rocket runs the mullen roads the still lane you can't keep pushing them off you know to do roads that eh, they weren't so bad and they're not even on the list 2015 i would support that move all along in the budget we're going through right now if we have to put more money towards it well that's something we can also address and look at you know i mean we're just in the beginning phases of deliberation I just want to be clear that, that the roads that they're talking about doing, the one inch or the two inch with that, those are on the roads 2010 program as well. And that's true. They are. Every one of them is in the roads 2010 program. But we're going to be taking out roads that were a full reconstruction to do them. Yeah, we're going to be, we're picking and choosing uh, the remaining roads, which ones we should do. We've got reconstruction roads, we've got thin overlay, and we've got two-inch overlay roads. And we're saying all those were promised in the 2010 program. Let's spend the money in the most effective manner and do these thin these overlays rather than reconstruction. And, and I think it, in, and I don't know what the exact number is, but I, I would say probably 65% of the money from that is going to be spent on reconstruction. So I'll leave 35% approximately on the, on the, again, what we're talking about with the uh, overlays and the, uh, I'm just, you know, I, the I need to come up. There's, There's the overlays. Thin overlays. Yeah, the thin overlays. Thin and thicker. Yeah, thin and thicker overlays. You Good. see my concern. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you know, one of the points going forward into the next program is to try and, and get a better mix. Like the town manager just stated, we did 65% of this 2010 program is already dedicated to reconstruction. Going forward, the next program, maybe the optimal mix is 50-50. Okay. I, just in the interest of time, because it's 10 o'clock, keep your questions focused. And we got a full agenda still in front of us. So Councilman Crowley. Well, thanks. After he goes, now i got to hurry up. <laughs> I think my first question is, Carol, who's your councilman? Ten years? I know. <laughs> you better talk to your uh, councilman. We won't get into the politics of that, Pat. <laughs> the only um, reason why you got your vote done was because of me. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Something that, that Joey touched on, and I'm not an expert on, on roads, so uh, I'm just going to ask the question. Uh, the cutout in, in, in repatch, like a uh, section that is very, very bad, what if we, we did the cutout and patch on some of these roads and then did an overlay to them? W would that work at saving the roads for a few years longer, possibly? Or um, are we just going to overlay the whole road? That's exactly what the one-inch overlay that I talked about mm -hmm. would be. If the road hasn't been crack-sealed recently, we crack-seal it. We go in and patch those areas that are really bad. Okay. Usually they're utility patches. Yeah. But repatch those before we put the overlay on. Okay. All right. So that, that makes kind of sense to me then. And, and what's, what's the life expectancy of something like that, just so we have... I mean, I think some people are just going to be thrilled that they're getting the one inch or the two inch. Some will be thrilled for that. But what's their expectancy? Are we talking, you know, a, a four-year lifespan, a 10-year lifespan? Okay. Uh, that one's kind of tough because... But I don't mean to put you on a spot. It does. It, it'll vary tremendously on the traffic loading. So if I put it on a little side street with 10 houses, you know, an overlay my last 20 years. Okay. Um, on that curve we talked about... The first thing we want to do is crack seal, and typically that's like six to seven years after you put a brand new pavement on, you want to do a crack seal. Okay. At about 12 to 15, probably is that first thin overlay. Okay. So, th so that that'll get us a large amount of roads covered, and that's I think this is why you guys are looking at it the way you're looking at it to try to get more bang for the buck. In other words. Um, in a short period of time. Now we're talking about a two-year window here. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. The for this project, for these, for the 30 streets. Yes. And and that would, if we do the 30 street, it's just the 30 streets. It's not the 17 also. For the uh, structural. No, it was the. It would cover that 47 streets. So it'd be 47 total. Yeah. Over two years. Okay. Thank you. All right, before the second round, I have a couple questions. First, a comment. Um, when we started Roads 2000, really the focus was the pavement management or pavement maintenance, and then to address some of the worst roads as a balance. But to me, it was more 65% maintain and 35% reconstruct, because we knew the reconstruct would soak up all the money. And the excitement over the, the results of Roads 2000, when you saw in your slide, you know, X amount of miles done, that's what sold uh, Roads 2005, and then there was still some goodwill left and it sold Roads 2010. But whoever devised a strategy to go to all total reconstruction, it's kind of like you're starting to take the wind out of the sails. Um, so you have to get up and get road get miles of road work done as long as it makes sense but the miles of road work needs to be done um, in any referendum we never put a list out saying these roads are promised to be done in a, in a uh, referendum we had a list of these could be done both kinds of types so I, I just I don't People felt like we were promising, but we also always told them it's not a for sure, for sure, because we've got to do a balance of both types of work. Something also to understand is I am sure the cost of oil, which is the base of, uh, you know, of bituminous, of pavement, that's also a factor. And, and we probably should have gone for a lot more money in Rhodes 2010, so it's almost the number of miles of work that we want to do should be the determiner of what the dollar is and not determine what the dollar and then have that decide how much road work can be done. Because in the end, that's why we saw it go from 72 to, or 70 whatever to 72 to 8, 78, yeah, and then down to 74. Um, just to me, that's, we probably have to rethink the philosophy when we go out and we get ready for roads 2015 um, because you got to regain that that forward momentum of road work I, to be honest i don't see road work going on in town and i remember back to, to and i know there is road work being done but you can't compare today mm -hmm. to what we did in road in 2000 there was road work everywhere and that's what sold the community on that 
hey, the town is doing the right thing. So I'm all for going for a mix. Um, and just tell me that your mix is going to address the still lanes. Your mix is going to address your rocket runs, because I think it will. Um, the work that you did on Beverly, a small street last year, you know, you put a thin overlay, but I, I'm assuming you went in there and you, you dug out potholes. I, maybe you just did the thin overlay. Um, but whatever work you're doing, it's got to sustain. You can't, as Kenny said, you can't waste the money for one year. Um, but do it right so that it, it gets 10 years or 15 years out of it. Um, all for the mix. Um, all for the preventative maintenance, the crack sealing. Um, I think we hired an outside firm that came in and did the crack sealing on some of the major roads. Uh, I'm sure our crews can do the box cuts and, and all of that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you guys come up with the plan. What I would like to see is a list. Here are the roads that were done in 2000, 2005, 2010. <coughs> now, also, on the same Excel spreadsheet, on the same line item, if you're proposing to do a road that's been hit, in 2000, 2005, or 2010 as part of this maintenance um, program, please let us know ahead of time. Like, so on the same, if, if it was done in 2000 as a total reconstruct, and now in 2014, part of it is the one inch overlay, then at least we can see, we can connect the dot between what was done way back when and what's done now 13, 14 years later. But keep it all on the same line so we can see what work because we'll get the complaints people will have already said in the past i know this road was repaved 10 years ago and how come you're putting more pavement down phoenix avenue is a classic example well it's a it's a heavy traveled road you don't want to lose it um, to then cost millions to have it redone but if you show us what was done and what plans to be done um, the visual will work at least for me and I'd love your presentation that you guys were flipping through if that can get sent out to the council because I don't we didn't I, um, we didn't get it it wasn't linked on our agenda so if we can get it sent out to us <coughs> Joey real quick you know I mean I, if we have a road that's lasted 60 years uh, I, I can't see especially if it's a low traveled road rebuilding that road to last another 60 years you know, I, I used to live over on westford avenue and the road was pretty tough but it, it there, there was 10 cars that went down it a day but we boxed that whole road out took it all out and and put a brand new base underneath there and and built it to highway standards there you probably could have just turned that under if that road would have lasted 10 15 years before it really went bad uh, at least we could have got other roads done and probably put them on the back side. And, and really, I think we need to look at how much this road is being used, how long it's been in there. Because if a road lasted 50 years and uh, it's, it's, it's coming apart now, even if that subgrade is not the best of stuff, it's still, once you turn that blacktop underneath it, it's going to be better than what was there originally, and we can get more roads done. And let's worry about it in 25 years. At least get... The, you know more roads done I, I really don't agree a hundred percent with you guys when we dig them out completely especially a road that isn't traveled a, a highly traveled road I agree but the ones that don't have a lot of traffic let's just try to get them going that that's Billy touched uh, on I'm that he touched that. <laughs> he touched on that the roads that we are having designed we're having them do boring see what's going on underneath and and try to use that yeah, stuff even if stuff is questionable and it can get us 20 years out of that road before it starts to really go, you know, we, we can't rebuild every road in town. We just got to make them safe. And that's the problem. With the money we're doing, we're not making the road safe. So, you know, we're going to have to do things that may not be 100%, but are going to buy us time. And then when, as time goes, we can look, let, let the 30 councils be uh, uh, past us uh, deal with it but right now we need to make the road safe and if that means we do a road that may not last 50 years but will last a little bit of length of time let's do it so the roads are safe all right good 
Carol? One quick comment. I like the idea of doing more roads, but I do want to see the list because I think it's it's got to be. One thing I, I respectfully disagree with Scott on is we did sell the first road referendum with specific roads on it, and they were scheduled to be done. They were colorized. I remember being at all the meetings. So we did do it that way, and I think, again, it goes back to what people vote for. They always look at their roads. Is my road going to be done? And when's it slated to be done? We didn't make promises, but we had roads on that referendum. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't want to leave any of those that were on those lists, 2000 and 2005, out of whatever you're doing now. I think we have to keep our promise to those people that voted for it. So that's all. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we'll bring back any of the other topics at the next meeting. Yes, thank you. Meaning the Abbey Road Broadbrook. Correct. Perfect. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, and that finishes your report, Matt. Town Attorney's report. Anything, Kevin? I think in light of that, I'll uh, <laughs> defer to next meeting. Qu <laughs> questions uh, for Kevin? A reports of special committees at council. Anything from the Enfield High School Building Committee? Okay. Not at this time, since we've been in budget, it's kind of hard for me and Pat to make the meetings. But as soon as budget's done, we'll start trying to attend them. Pat, uh, yeah, and, and, and it, they had a meeting Saturday to uh, um, pick the um, construction it, manager at risk. And, and there's still some question going back and forth about it, so we'll, we'll get back to you as soon as we do get a clear answer on that. Yeah, and and I know once they make that final decision. Um, they'll come and present to uh, to the council and to the board as they did last time. Yeah. So, okay. any other reports of special committees of the council? Old business um, appointments. Town council all remain on the table. Matt, any appointments? Town manager all remain on the table, and items C, D, and E remain on the table. Uh, no new business. There is no new business listed. Items for discussion, um, items A1 through 14 have been moved to miscellaneous. Appointments of the council will move to the next agenda. Um, items D, E, F, G, and H have been moved to miscellaneous. So under item I, it's a resolution accepting the IAEP local R1-717 contract, and that is our EMS. Uh, employees that contract uh, there's a tentative agreement that contract is posted on the towns or will be posted tomorrow morning uh, on the town's website for the 10-day viewing period and uh, the council will consider taking action at our next council meeting on May 20th uh, discussion next item J discussion of modification yard waste collection shall we Move this to the next meeting. Yeah, I recommend that. Anyone? That's fine with me. Move to the next. Okay. So that moves us to miscellaneous. Uh, next, uh, the first item under miscellaneous is I need a motion to adopt the consent agenda items A A one through A fourteen. So moved. Moved by Deputy Mayor Nelson, second by Councilman Hall. Discussion. Sensing none by show of hands, all those in favor of the consent agenda? Those opposed? Any abstentions? One in opposition. I can't go with item 12. Okay. Um, consent agenda is adopted. Next item is discussion resolution. Resolution setting a public hearing on the acquisition of three parcels of land located on Moody Road. Um, Second. Where, <laughs> whereas the Enfield Town Council wishes to acquire three parcels uh, from the estate of Stanley Jablonski Jr., totaling 10.66 acres, and located on Moody Road, and identified as assessor's map ID 075-0018-075-0033-075-0026. And whereas the proposed acquisition of the property will allow for long-term opportunity for the town to address future municipal needs, particularly the Public Works Department, whose site is fully developed, and whereas on April 4, 2013, at a regular meeting of the Enfield Planning and Zoning Commission, 
the Commission voted to recommend to the Council the acquisition of the three parcels in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut General Statute Section 8-24. And whereas the Town Council wishes to seek input on the acquisition of the three parcels from the public, now therefore be it resolved that the Enfield Town Council does hereby schedule a public hearing to be held on May 6th, that's today, May 20th, 2013, right, at 6.50 p.m. In uh, Enfield Town Hall Council Chambers, 820 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut, in order to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the acquisition. Motion to approve is amended. By Deputy Mayor Nelson, seconded by Councilman Hall, public hearing May 20th, 2013 at 6.50 p.m. Any discussion? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councilman Lee. Four. Councilman Mancini. Four. Four. Councilman Stokes. Four. Councilman Arnone. Four. Councilman Bosco. Four. Councilman Crawley. Four. Councilman Edgar. Four. Councilman Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Councilman Kinsler. Four. It's eleven in favor, none against, no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution regarding an 8-24 referral to planning and zoning for two Chapel Street. Whereas the Enfield Town Council wishes to acquire from Demick LLC a 0.24 acre parcel of land located at 2 Chapel Street and identified as Assessor's Map ID 027-0162 and whereas acquisition of the property would provide an opportunity for the town to address future municipal and recreational needs and whereas the council must refer the proposed acquisition to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a report in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut General Statute Section 8-24. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the proposed acquisition of the property hereby be referred to the Planning and Zoning Commission in conformance with the requirements of Connecticut General Statute Section 8-24. So, moved by Councilman Kensler, seconded by Deputy Mayor Nelson. Discussion? <coughs> Discussion? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councilman Lee? Four. Councilman Mangini. Four. Counts Deputy Four. Mayor Nelson. Councilman Stokes. Four. Councilman Arnone. Four. Councilman Bosco. Four. Councilman Crawley. Four. Councilman Edgar. Four. Councilman Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Councilman Kinsler. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Next item, discussion resolution. Resolution setting a public hearing for the acquisition of a parcel of land at 2 Chapel Street. Whereas the Enfield Town Council wishes to acquire from Demick LLC a 0.24 acre parcel of land located at 2 Chapel Street and identified as Assessor's Map ID 027-0162. And whereas acquisition of the property would provide an opportunity for the town to address future municipal and recreational needs and whereas the council wishes to seek input from the public on the proposed acquisition now therefore be it resolved that the enfield town council does hereby schedule a public hearing to be held on may 20th 2013 at 6 45 p.m in the enfield town hall council chambers 820 enfield street enfield connecticut in order to allow interested citizens an opportunity to express their opinions regarding the proposed acquisition. So moved. By Deputy Mayor Nelson, seconded by Councilman Lee. Discussion? Discussion? Sensing none, roll call please. Councilman Lee? Four. Councilman Mangi? Four. Deputy Mayor Nelson? Four. Councilman Stokes? Four. Councilman Arnone? Four. Councilman Bosco? Four. Councilman Crawley? Four. Councilman Edgar. Four. Councilman Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Councilman Kinsler. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. Next item, discussion, resolution, resolution accepting the armed school security officer supervisor position. Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 7, Section 2 of the Town Charter, the Enfield Town Council does hereby amend the classification plan to include the following new job description in the town budget for fiscal year 13-14 for the police department. Add one armed school security officer supervisor position, $29 per hour. Moved. Moved by Councilman Hall. Seconded by Councilman Stokes. Discussion. Councilman Lee. This is the, we're resolving to accept the job description. Is that 
really the and, extent of this acceptance? And setting the rate. I see. Okay. Thank you. Discussion. Councilman Edgar. Has that person already been hired? Yes. And as you might remember, this was an oversight from the last meeting that council asked us to bring back. Further discussion? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councilman Lee? Four. Councilman Mancini? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Deputy Mayor Nelson? Against. Councilman Stokes? Four. Councilman Arnone? Abstain. Councilman Bosco? Against. Councilman Crowley? Four. Councilman Edgar? Against. Councilman Hall? Four. Mayor Copen? Four. Councilman Kinsler? Abstain. All right. It's going to take me a minute. One, two, three, four. We only have five in favor. We have one, two, three, four against, and two abstentions, I believe. Is that right? No, I'm sorry. There were two abstentions. Well, it, if no one wants to change, if anyone who abstained does not want to change their vote into the affirmative, that the motion fails. Do you want to wait for Cindy? Cindy's a no. That's why she walked out. She didn't want to vote? Nope. Okay. Sensing uh, there's not support, the motion fails. Next item on the agenda is discussion resolution, resolution authorizing the town manager to enter into an agreement with CROG, uh, STP Urban Program Grant. Whereas the Capital Region Council of Governments has requested proposals from municipalities for transportation projects to be funded under the Federal Surface Transportation Program, STP Urban, and whereas CROG has a approximately four million dollars available to disperse to Connecticut towns for this purpose of which 3.2 million is federal funds and whereas the funds will be awarded on a competitive basis according to project selection procedures developed by the CROG Transportation Committee and whereas the town wishes to apply to CROG for funds for a project to rehabilitate pavement for the Freshwater Boulevard pavement rehabilitation project on Freshwater Boulevard specifically from Elm Street State Route 220 to a point approximately 800 feet north of Cranbrook, Cranbrook Boulevard and whereas the total cost of the project is estimated to be approximately $877,210 and whereas the STPE urban program would be responsible for providing an 80% match for the cost of rights of way in construction or approximately $701,768. And whereas the town would be responsible for providing a 20% match for the cost of rights of way in construction or approximately $175,442. And whereas the town would be responsible for the full cost of design of the project. And whereas CROG requires a resolution from the town council supporting this project proposal. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town council endorses the application by the town manager to CROG for for the project and be it further resolved that upon CROG approval of the project, the town will provide the required local match for the project. So moved. Second. By Deputy Mayor Nelson, seconded by Councilman Mangini. Any discussion? Yeah. Councilman Hall? Uh, through the mayor to Matt, uh, I know you got the email on my question on the sidewalk. I apologize if you answered it. I've been. Yep. I, was, I was planning on answering it because I did send that out. Um, this grant does not allow sidewalk work, but okay. that uh, fresh water is on the the roads 2010 list, so we could use monies from roads 2010 for sidewalk improvements. Okay, because so there's no way they would allow sidewalk work with this project, even though we don't have handicap accessible areas on that road the grant the grant would not pay for the sidewalks okay so we could do it and probably as we bid it out add you know add it as as, as another separate, item right okay. but it would have to be paid for through town money which would either be roads 2010 or or other monies can we at least bid it out and see what the cost is because <coughs> we've we've had yeah. the we've had the state out there yep. looking at it 
they they may pony up a little bit. I don't know, but no, they won't. Yeah, probably not. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was worth a try. Yeah, it's just the grant grant itself wouldn't pay for that. Right. But we can do that as part of the project. Okay. We'd have to pay for it. We've had a ton of people yep. that have come forward on that that corner. So, thank you. Thanks, Carol. Cindy. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good um, opportunity for, for us to go forward with this. Now, my question would be, though, if we're not successful in getting the grant, are we still on the hook for the $701,000? No. So it's only if we receive the grant that our portion is the $701,000? No. What is our portion, projected portion of, of the cost? It's uh, <clears throat> is the total project seven zero one seven six eight. So we're we're only on the hook for twenty percent. Is that right? No, Matt's saying yes. Twenty percent of seven zero one. We we are responsible and in. In the resolution that was read by the mayor, yep. the 20% match for the cost of right away in construction, or approximately $175,442. Okay. And when will we find out what what the results are? <clears throat> approximately. Um, probably sometime during the summer, <coughs> late summer. Okay. Usually when they come out with those. And Public Works will get back to us yep. with that. I'll, I'll let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Ken? Um, also, along with Councilman Hall, if we could have DPW look into uh, the cost if we did it in-house, or is the project too big? Because we're kind of only filling in the sep uh, sections and putting the wheelchair accessibility in it. And it's nice. There's 600000 that we should be saving approximately that we can put towards those road overlays and re you know, not reconstruction. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Um, just where is approximately 800 feet north of Cranbrook? I, is that right around, what, Hot Table Panini or? It's basically where the uh, Cranbrook intersection work ended. In other words, there's a portion of fresh water that was paved with the Correct. intersection of Cranbrook. So that number is basically where that pavement so, improvement ended. So, so it would be And then the. Then the, the sidewalk, the missing sidewalk pieces and the, and the handicap ramps, are they there? Closer to Hazard Avenue. Okay, so it's really out of the project scope, right. but we, we're looking to do the work at the same time, if not before. So, uh, you know, hopefully our in-house mm -hmm. crews can do it. So, okay. Um, anyone else? Sensing none, roll call, please. Councilman Lee. Four. Councilman Mangini. Four. Deputy Mayor Nelson. Four. Councilman Stokes. Four. Councilman Arnone. Four. Councilman Bosco. Four. Councilman Crowley. Four. Councilman Edgar. Four. Councilman Hall. Four. Mayor Copen. Four. Councilman Kinsler. Four. There's 11 in favor, none against, no abstentions. That completes miscellaneous. Uh, public communications is next. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? Margaret. Margaret Jedzeniak, Abbey Road and Pew. Just so the council knows, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. I apologize. <laughs> um, and just so you know that when I was the chairman of the Commission on Aging, our group initiating creating an all day uh, adult daycare. We also checked on the conditions of the elderly living quarters and a lot of other things. And when my husband had to enter the nursing home, Pam Brown was a help to me with her advice. So I'm sure she's looking into the problem at the daycare now. 
I guess it's because mm -hmm. people can't afford it. And we also suggested a program of people at the daycare and other people helping each other. And if you helped someone else, then you got time for that put down for you. And if you needed help, they would help you. So we thought that was a good idea, but I don't know if it, if it was ever tried anyway. And anyway, uh, at the time, I hear you're talking all about this, the, uh, the, <laughs> the ro roads, anyway, and at that time, we were in it way, way ahead of what's going on now. And our town manager at the time, at Buckhorn, was told by a judge to our town manager that he couldn't even talk about the problem at, at that time. I remember when I went in front of the council and he was told not to even mention that project. And at that time, people couldn't were not supposed to build there. And I think people should look into what those minutes of those meetings at that time said, and I think you'll find a lot of what was going on at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Public communications? Very good. Uh, any councilman communications? Councilman Lee. Just a, just a quick one, good of the order. Um, the, uh, the Buzz Robotics team, as you all know, uh, competed two weekends ago out at St. Louis in the national championships. They had a, a great run. I think they finished five and three. Uh, ended up, I believe, number 23rd in the country. And um, they did get picked in, uh, in some of the um, final rounds as a, a partner to some of the final competing teams. So they had a great run. Uh, but today, actually, it was announced and, um, and shared with, with some folks, um, Tom and myself, that the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference is going to um, host a Connecticut State Championship uh, round for all the robotics programs in Connecticut. And uh, Buzz will be competing with uh, a couple dozen others. And that's going to take place down at the Armory, the O'Neill Armory in Hartford on May 11th. Uh, I think competition is going to start up at 8 AM and go all day. And uh, so Buzz will have another shot at uh, earning the state champ crown. So we wish them the best of luck and uh, more success in their season. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bill. Any other councilman communications? I just Councilman Hall. I'm sorry, I can't keep my mouth shut. I, I'm greatly disappointed in the abstentions tonight. Um, not really sure why we had abstentions. I, I think it's it was a pretty easy yes or no. Um, and I, I'm also disappointed when people can't sit in their seat and vote one way or another. I think it's you, we were voted in our positions to make tough decisions, whether we agree with each other or disagree with each other. I think you're here to place a vote. So I'm just disgusted and I wanted to share that. Thank you, Carol. Councilman Communications. Councilman Arnone. Yeah, I, I abstained uh, for lack of information and uh, issues regarding executive session, which I cannot discuss. Thank you. Any further Councilman Communications? Sensing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. By Councilman Hall, seconded by Deputy Mayor Nelson. All those in favor? Everyone, those opposed? We are adjourned. Have a good evening.